Out of the gates, ready to go. Outkick 360 underway. Friday edition is here from 6th and Peabody with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. The entire cast and crew alongside for a jam-packed show to get you into the weekend. Off of the July 4th short week, ready for a, a weekend of plenty to discuss. Wimbledon is on this weekend. We'll be watching that, in a, and we'll give you a reason why in a moment. Uh, beyond that... All eyes on college and pro football. Bobby Carpenter joins us in 20 minutes. Skylar Callahan with allpanthers.com. He will join us in an hour. We'll chat about the Baker Mayfield trade to Carolina from Cleveland. Austin Price of allquest.com joins us as uh, they do each and every Friday in the 5 o'clock Eastern hour. And Tyrell Dotson, linebacker for the Buffalo Bills, joins us in studio during hour number two. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. One just passing thought that I had. When Rafa Nadal withdraws from Wimbledon and there's only one semifinal match, what does that cost Wimbledon, if anything? Do they owe money back Probably. to television partners? That's a great question. Well, for not getting a second semifinal? Ticket buyers. Well, I don't know how the tickets work. Do they, I don't know. They buy like an all tournament pass. Do you? Well, there are no, some. Well, there are some all tournament passes. Is there passes. fine there. print that you just have semifinal tickets? And you're there for both matches, and you don't get a refund if one of them doesn't happen. The so my uh, Claire's uncle was actually there um, at Wimbledon, and going going into the trip, he bought the all access pass for, for the, whole, the, the whole campus, which is tremendous. Um, so I'll ask him. I'll be able to text him and ask him about I, that. I'd like to I, know how that. Surely works. you can buy the individual individual. I would think so. Or semifinal. I would think uh, so. Right. I think I think semifinal is probably a package. For for the two yeah. matches, so are you getting half your money back? Are you anyway, there, There's is, probably there's probably on the back of the ticket a uh, your SOL yeah. if a guy defaults. There are times where I just uh, throw something out there in hopes that someone does the research yeah. or they report it and find out. But I was thinking when Nadal has to medically withdraw from the tournament, costing Wimbledon a semifinal one of two on the men's side. What does that cost them, if anything? And there may be fine print with the with the TV contract I, too. I, probably, if a guy medically defaults. It's it's our everybody's tough luck. But it's classy video I passed you guys of him uh, yeah. leaving the facility, just going up to everybody, the desk people, and everybody, anybody that asked for a picture, he posed and he was thanking everybody. Obviously, been there a lot and often, and knows a lot of people. But super classy dude. Hugging, yeah, it's, hugging, it's, and taking selfies with literally everybody who wanted one. You know, and it was a two-minute video, and yeah. it, 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 you, you could tell he probably did 15 minutes of that. But yeah, easy to terrific. like the guy after watching that video of him doing that. It's funny because I, I'm reading this book about the history of HBO, and uh, Mary Carrillo is in a part of it about Wimbledon when HBO had the rights to Wimbledon. It said her first impression of Billie Jean King was their first day of working a full day on set together at Wimbledon, calling a match, then doing a studio post post-match show and they're there all day, was Billie Jean King went to every person in production and shook their hand and thanked them for working that day. And she said, always made an impact on me. Here was this legend. Yeah. I was not much of anyone in tennis. And every single day made a point to go to everyone on set and thank them for, for their work that day. It's cool when somebody legendary knows cool. what an impact they can have by being like that for what's a relatively short amount of time but the impact that can leave by being that. Dudes, I, I'm feeling great. I, you know, I've been eating well for three weeks now. I did Iron Tribe this morning and everything. Yet, I am sad and melancholy because you guys know I hate change and I've got this huge sentimental streak. And I don't know if you remember back I, when I was doing that little solo podcast, I did one about this barn near my yes. house yes that is a yeah. very like it's the most landmarky thing it's not even in my neighborhood but it's in my area let's say it's probably three miles four miles from my house and i drive by it on a regular basis and it got i don't know if i told you but like the last time there were tornadoes around it took a beating and it was down to the framework for most of the roof of the barn but word was there was a discussion going on on like the expanded next door app. You know, you can take your next door app and go from your neighborhood to the general region to bigger. Word was that the owners of this were going to try to restore it. And they knew that people had an appreciation for it and it served as a landmark. But the tornado stripped it down to really bare bones. 
And, and then the most recent storm, this is a couple months ago again, dented in one side of the framework. And I thought, boy, if they're going to fix that, they're really putting in something. Well, I drove by it yesterday or the day before, and one side of that was gone. And then I drove by it yesterday, and it looked like this. Yeah, oh, so it's no. just a skeleton. So it, it's not even a skeleton. It's two sides, and the skeleton you can see in the middle is basically down. Yeah, it looks so like a I skateboard ramp. They're taking it. <laughs> I, they got, they're either taking it. Looks like it looks like the start of Noah's Ark. They're either taking it down or they're rebuilding. <laughs> it's going to be a new barn. So now, the thing I'm about those, for a new barn. The but, thing about these old buildings that sucks, uh, because we have one on the family farm that was built uh, like 1901. And... Anything from that type of era and before, like especially in the rural parts of the country, they are literally built on about four rocks. Yeah, there's nothing like to the, it. The, they're built on four corners with massive stones, and that was the foundation of the home. So my parents were looking into trying to restore this family farmhouse, but you can't. Like, the, There's no way to get to the foundation of the, the actual bare bones of the structure to save it. So they're in the process of taking it down as we speak. So that makes me sad that, too. But I'm, I'm sure, like if a house is, can barely stand from that era, I can't imagine how long. Like, how many tornadoes do you think this building survived? I don't through? know because this this spot, you might know it, Chad. It's at Moore's Lane. I know exactly where you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, how it survived anything semi-tornadic is yeah. a miracle. No, I agree. Based on what you're saying, I, I'm sure it doesn't have much of a foundation. It's a, it's a beautiful building, white and red. <laughs> you can get a hint of it. Uh, but I, I, when I did the podcast on it, I talked about how my sadness for it being a creaky may, it disgusted me because I felt more about the building, this landmark, than I felt <laughs> about some things that were actually important in my life at times. Well, I think and the, now it you, makes me sad that other, it's probably going away and that affects me more than some real bleep in my life. The other thing that sucks too is you see I see that photo and I think that will soon be like a Dunkin Donuts or a Starbucks. Well, it's it's not commercial, but it, it's already hut roped off and they're building houses around it. They, yeah. they carved it out to leave it there while they build two dozen houses it's around. It's going to be a collection it. of townhomes. Or yeah, houses, no, houses with houses. A, 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 a eighth of an acre. Yeah, you know right. that it's going to be on. With gonna, no room for put, a pool or a playground because they can't waste the property that they they're can't gonna sell. They're going to fit twenty homes on that property where that barn is right now. Yeah. It's probably my guess. And the developers probably thinking, "Oh, great, the barn's down. Maybe I could buy that and build two houses on it." <laughs> it also looks like a property we would throw a keg party on back in the early two no thousand. <laughs> yeah. And you would like tell stories about what goes on in the barn. <laughs> The whole time there'd be mythology around the barn, so and no one would ever step foot in the barn. Oh, yeah. The keg party would happen in the around field the next barn. to the barn. So this is a great seg. Um, Chad, you, you mentioned the mythology. The, there's little mythology going on in, in the Withrow household, uh, ghosts oh. and goblins and ghouls. So I am without my family for the next nine days. They are in Nebraska Whoa. right now. So Speaking of parties. There was a very, uh, very, very early uh, <laughs> wake-up call this morning. And uh, we had to wake up at 4.45 to leave the house at 5 to get them to the airport. And I'm driving them to the airport. Alarm set for 4.45 a.m. Well, at 4.36 a.m., I hear, Daddy, 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 from my oldest daughter's room. So I go in there, and she sounds distressed. Like something's going, not just a normal wake up, like somebody come get me type thing. Go into her room, and there is this strange noise. Like I just got done watching Stranger Things. And it's this weird mechanical, the best way I could describe it, going over and over. I feel like, but I very did. Faint. like a drowning cat. And she's pointing to her, her nightstand, and I'm, I'm listening to it. She's like, what is this noise? You know, she's freaked out, which I would be too. And it's her uh, star projector. She's got like a little oh. uh, alarm clock that you, you hit it, and it's got the stars that go up on the wall when you click it. Battery was going out. <clears throat> so this thing is dying. Making this weird sound. Well, Angie and I have no time to mess with this, right? Like, we're getting them ready to throw them in the you car. You just take it and smash it. Going. No, I just walk it back into, like, my closet in the bedroom, and we don't mess with it. We leave, go, and Angie says when we're dropping her off, she's like, hey, you're going to have to get a screwdriver out to get the battery out, or it's just eventually just going to die on its own. Well, this thing's still going strong. I did not go back to sleep when I got home. Just could not go back to sleep. Started getting ready for the day. I'm showering, getting ready to come in. This is... Seven hours, six, seven hours at this point. 
after it started going off in the middle of the night, still making that crazy noise. So now I'm kind of fascinated to see how long this battery problem can run. last. And every morning I'm going to wake up and go and check and see if that noise is still happening. I'm impressed that Evie or maybe it's just haunted. Stuck it maybe. out maybe. and didn't just like tear out of there, but called you in with the curiosity to examine it rather than just getting the hell out of Dodge. Yeah, I would have. I would have probably at seven years old just you know run out into the yard yeah. or something, thinking I was being attacked in the house. That's big by her. I commend her. I get caught down the the rabbit hole of YouTube and then the 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 reels on Instagram. And there's clearly an algorithm because they know what I yeah, sit there yeah. and watch. They're right up your alley. But like, there is uh, there are these ones where it's like some of the freakiest things you'll see on Earth, or uh, why 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 you don't swim in the ocean, like those the themes like they that. Can't you can't get me on that. Those are like 15 seconds long, and then you see like a whale come out and just cap, just go right over a boat or whatever. Um, and I hesitate to even tell Chad this because you know I, I am thinking of it as he's telling his story. But there is this one that I saw literally last night of this kid, this toddler who's in the bathroom, in the doorway of the bathroom, talking to the ceiling. And the mom comes up with her phone and says, who are you talking to? Who are you, who are you telling good night? And he's, he, the kid points up at the vent in the ceiling where they later found some dude in their attic. Oh, God. Oh, my goodness. That's freaky. How I got, I, like, that, like, you see the kid clearly was talking to that guy. Or whoever it was, and the mom never saw it and was getting on to the child for it. Didn't and then, our, like, fine print at the bottom. Like two weeks later, they found so and so up there. Didn't That's our old creepy. boss Brad Willis have a family member who had someone living in their attic? Oh. At one point, uh, I, I could text and find out. I feel like this is a story he told at one point. Like his sister, maybe had someone that snuck into their attic and was living there. That's well, the other creepy. night, it's, it's always you get those eerie little feelings, like something's off. Okay, like you're in the house and you hear something that's just not yeah, right. Yeah. The other night, I'm putting my daughter to bed, and Angie stops me and she just starts pointing up. It's funny you mentioned this, pointing up to her the attics in her room, and she's like, her "Did room water or just your room? in in oh in Evie's in Evie's Sorry. room? Yeah, I'm putting Evie to bed, pointing up, and she says water just dripped on me from the attic. Like is something going on? I'm like, well, the air conditioning unit's up there, so maybe maybe it's that. I think it was just a figment of her imagination. Cause I sat there for five minutes, watching, waiting, trying to feel water, and nothing came down. But there's that moment where you're thinking, could there be someone up in that in that attic right now? That just odd feeling of yeah, there's a what are you seeing, and why do you look so scared when you're around someone? You can see it in their face, like something's off here. What's going on? I'm gonna go back to these reels for a second, cause. I watch videos on Facebook, and it's fine, obviously. But I watch some of these reels, they cut off. And and then you can't get, I can't go to Instagram. Like, they won't take me to Instagram where they originate, but there seems to be a time limit on the reel. So I, I invest in a reel however many seconds or minutes. And then it cuts off before the punchline or the finish of the trick or whatever. So it seems like it doesn't marry very well with Instagram. And I get all pissed off. I don't know. Do I don't you know. That? I don't know if it's like a TikTok to Instagram transition well, that they're doing or is. something. Because uh, half the time, uh, I I see something that I think is cool and I share it, and I get a message back from somebody that's like, "Yeah, this has been on TikTok for like a month," you know. And Instagram is always uh, second to second in line on that. By the way, I heard back from Danny uh, over at TikTok. Wimbledon. He said, "Hey, each ticket is for a particular day. Wimbledon offered a refund if you held a ticket for center court today." If you bought from a third party broker, you were screwed. We got lucky. We had tickets for Monday and Wednesday. So you had a blast. Nice. So there's your answer. So Wimbledon Good. did offer the refund. Now we need to find out the television the contract part. if they if they owe money back or if they're just protected. I'll text and uh, I'll tweet Andrew Marchand uh, of the New York Post. He's very responsive to me. I was having trouble nailing down the Yankees play-by-play guy last night for sure, who didn't identify himself during the telecast. It's Ryan Ruoco who subs for Michael Kay and is excellent. But I thought it could have been Bob Lorenz, and he never said anything during the show, so I just, just assume. texted him. I texted Marchand. I said, is this Ruoco doing the Yankee game on yes? And he immediately answered, yes. Hit yes, us up yes, on, on Twitter. Yes. On yes. At Outkick360 is where you can find us. Coming up, Bobby Carpenter joins the show. A lot to discuss with the former Buckeye, as we will get into Oregon and Washington, and what's next for the Big Ten. The, the story that we did not hit with him last week, that Ohio State 
considered going independent during COVID and coming up with their own television deal. We'll get Bobby's take on that. Plus, he has a great rookie dinner story that he wants to add to our discussion from a couple of weeks ago. His second year in the league, he tells that story with us next on OutKick 360.
Tyrell Dotson, linebacker for the Buffalo Bills, will join us in studio today. That's coming up in an hour. Austin Price of AllQuest.com, plus Skylar Callahan of AllPanthers.com. I hope I got that right. I think so. AllPanthers.com. Uh, he will be with us uh, coming up in 40 minutes. Glad you're with us for OutKick 360 across the OutKick network. And we uh, got some big topics. I, I have some information. Paul, you were asking during the break what Chad's going to be up to while his family's in Nebraska before he meets them there. I have, I have a record. I, I, he's going to be trying to bootleg a new album that I, I have for him. Is uh, it going to number one in the country charts? And maybe for 50 consecutive weeks. I have no idea what this is, but I can't wait to oh, hear about it. This is going to be a total it is, surprise. It is uh, Chad with Well, I know jam. the genre. It's, it, well, there's only like two or three to choose from uh, or what yeah, it could be. They all grew up. Yes. Uh, there is a free agency watch. We don't talk a ton of NHL. There's a free agency watch for the 13th of July to keep an eye on. We'll tell you who that player is and why it's important uh, across the, the southern region of our listening audience. And an all-time hockey name that we pass along to you. We also Spake. say hello to Bobby Carpenter. Uh, that is synonymous with football, much like this hockey name will be with hockey. Uh, Bobby, hope you're doing well, man. I'm doing great, guys. You know, I mean, watched a little bit of the NHL draft last night when you are watching a couple of uh, draftees' parents kind of pseudo make out when he gets drafted. I mean, that's, that's a win for everybody, is it not? So you got to give the people what they want, Bobby. That's what they were doing. Giving that's the people better what than the NBA parents were doing. So, yeah, no doubt, <laughs> step up. I'm just, I'm, what, what were you doing watching the NHL yeah, draft? That seems uncharacteristic. Hey, listen, we had the Columbus Blue Jackets, they had the uh, sixth and 12th pick. So, trying to make sure, keeping abreast with that for my local radio show. So, okay. I'll dip in and dip out. It was like, a, it's not the NFL draft for me. It's not appointment watching, but um, I'll dip in and dip out. I thought they did a pretty good job on the coverage, what, at what, least what I saw. What percentage of your show this morning was about the Blue Jackets draft? Oh, goodness. Sports Three update. hours. I would say we touched on it every hour for probably five to seven minutes. Then we had Mark Shaggy, the hockey writers on for probably 15. So maybe 15 to 20%. I mean, the rest of the stuff is going to generally be NFL news. And, uh, you know, still with all the craziness that's uh, swirling around college football right now, that's basically been dominating everything. We know the formula. That sounds a little hockey heavy, but not bad. Yeah, we, we have a, a, a couple headlines from last week to hit with you, and uh, I want to get to a list that you retweeted. Oh, uh, I had Bobby that on well. my list too. Um, but first, the, the, the story that came out that Ohio State was considering going independent during COVID and that w they would negotiate their own television contract. Um, we don't deal with a lot of what ifs because we know how things played out. They eventually played. But as a Buckeye yourself, what do you think this would have turned into had they decided to go independent? My goodness. Uh, I, I don't know if that would have been a long-term play. I do know this. Like, Ohio State was very frustrated with the attitude that the rest of the conference had taken with that. And I think it kind of was directed from the top with Kevin Warren. And a lot of that was reciprocated by the Pac-12. And then all of a sudden, they saw the ACC, Big 12 kind of joining with the SEC. And here's the thing, Ohio State you know, athletically tries to be all things to all people. They want to try to be you know, an SEC football program um, and compete at the highest level there and do that on a national scale. And they've done a pretty darn good job of it. But then they also want to sit there and try to be you know, 36 varsity sports and play nice and be a good partner to the rest of the Big 10 when the reality is you know, they're carrying the majority of the weight as far as the TV rights. And then also, you know, with that, you know, the fan base and also the national prestige of being able to play in a lot of these, you know, elite national games. And they're like, we're the team that's out here driving it. If you guys aren't going to, you know, at least let us go play and try to win a national championship. Like, I think that was the frustration with Gene Smith. And you know, he had mentioned that at the time. And I do know this, I mean, they looked into it legally, what it would take the financial penalties to break out. I mean, so it was something that they kind of researched a little bit and it was kind of a fleeting thought. And then the next, I think, uh, play was, hey, how do we get everybody on the same team? But yes, um, there was a lot there, obviously, with what they were what they were ultimately trying to do. And it was, 
It, it was Gene Smith speaking probably more candidly than most people are used to. And it's not, you know, it's hard for me not to read into the leadership qualities of last year, uh, the COVID year, and what we what we just saw. And it, for example, Gene Smith's trying, and he, he's admitting, hey, we, we consider going independent in 2020 because Kevin Warren was shutting things down at the start of everything. Well, this past, this past week, it was Gene Smith and Ohio State that came out publicly about USC and UCLA, right? They were the first to comment on that from the Big Ten standpoint. It wasn't Kevin Warren. What do you make of Ohio State taking the leadership role in that? I think it's something that they've needed to do. And Gene talks all the time about being a good partner to the league and in the conference and trying to make sure he's doing right by everybody. You know, But at some point, I think that this USC... Um, UCLA bit happened, and if you look at it, no one's going to come out overtly and say this, but if you can connect the dots, I mean, Martin Jarman, UCLA's athletic director, worked directly under Gene Smith at Ohio State, and Mike Bone was at Cincinnati, and I know that they had a lot of discussions back when he was here, and they're very friendly as well, and make no mistake, I mean, he is the commonality, the common thread that connects those guys to the Big Ten. And the fact that I still don't think, I mean, I've looked around and I just want to make sure I don't, I haven't missed anything, but I don't think anybody from the Big Ten office has commented uh, verbally. I mean, we've seen the statement pushed pushed out, you know, and it's on social media and, you know, the press release, but nobody's gotten in front of a camera and answered any questions other than Gene Smith, who, who's the AD, and then President Christina Johnson. So I was waiting this week. You know, 4th of July was Monday. Okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you Tuesday. But by like Wednesday or Thursday, you would have thought someone from the league office would have sat down and done an interview and had a press conference answering questions. Is this done? What were the qualifications? Why now? Someone in an official capacity with the conference, which was very surprising to me. And I, I don't believe that any of the other athletic directors across the Big Ten have, have commented on it either. And frankly, you know, I, no one in the Pac-12, like I don't think has really got out there. They've They've issued some statements, but no one's really commented on this because I, I think there's still a little bit of obviously the shifting of the sands and people trying to figure out exactly how this is all going to transpire and what exactly is going to happen. So you know, there's a lot to digest there with it. But Ohio State finally taking the leadership role and looking around and saying, if we don't go after these guys now, it, we had a chance with uh, Texas and Oklahoma. We probably could have pulled them in prior to the, the SEC if we really would have pursued it hard. They chose not to, cannot be passive anymore. And so this, to me, has Gene Smith's fingerprints all over it in a very positive and good way, because I think it was something that obviously had to happen, because if it didn't, who knows what it would have looked like. Bobby, did former Buckeye and current Notre Dame head coach Marcus Freeman walk back his comments enough for you when he was quoted as saying, you have to go to class at Notre Dame, unlike at Ohio State? He came back and said, I would never – discredit Ohio State he's talking about how big the school is and if you miss class you can make it up online or go to appointments and you just can't do that at Notre Dame did he walk it back enough for you as a Buckeye so the comments that he the retraction was actually issued on my radio station in Columbus he texted me in the morning and wanted to come on and explain it Marcus he's a friend and I was like I'm going to give you the opportunity I'm going to ask some tough questions um but what he he read the transcript he was I, I talked to uh was it Dennis Dodd who he sat down with, I believe? And he goes, he gave me the transcript. And what he basically said was, he's like, Notre Dame has 8,000 students, to paraphrase him. He's like, at Ohio State, you got 60. You know, at schools like Cincinnati, where he was at before, he's like, you got 35, 40,000. If you don't go to class, nobody notices within the academic realm. And he goes, if you don't go to class at Notre Dame, when you have a class of 30 people, the professor's going to notice. Now, obviously, at Ohio State, I told Marcus this. I'm like, buddy, don't, don't give me that. Like, I went to class. A lot of guys have gone to class. It's, it's a personal choice. And frankly, if you get good grades, what does it matter if you go anyway? Because normal students only go as much as they need to anyway. So I, I felt like he pulled it back enough. And to talk to it more about being about the size of the school. And a lot of people didn't realize how small, uh, small of university Notre Dame is. Like, the University of Dayton has like four. 14,000 people. So Notre Dame, just in the fact that it's a Catholic school and private is one thing, but it is very, very small. Classes are small. And I think he was trying to pitch more of the intimate experience of what it's going to be. And he, I, I thought it was sufficient. There are still a lot of Ohio State fans that 
I mean, it would never be sufficient enough for them. But I thought it was genuine. I thought it was very genuine. And he read the transcript and Dennis Dodd had kind of lopped off the front of it where he kind of qualified what he was saying. So big picture question for you here. A lot of Notre Dame and Ohio State tie-ins here to start your segment with us. If Notre Dame can be a member of the ACC in all but football, can't these football super conferences just allow teams to break off from their current conference and only compete in football and stay in their conference? Example, if USC and UCLA don't want to send their volleyball team to Rutgers, why don't they just stay in the Pac-12 and just allow these football-dictated decisions to be about football and not require the entire athletic department to join a conference? Would that work? Here's the thing, though. Notre Dame was never in a conference initially. And so I think they had a loose affiliation with the Big East, and obviously that that changed. And then ultimately now at the ACC, but they were never in the AC pulling out. And I think what people were very upset about, it's like, you know, getting separated or divorced from your wife, dating someone else and living in the same house. Like, all right, yeah, it's good for the kids. And then this works. But like the top line isn't going to equate because the Big Ten is going to be dumping a hundred million dollars into your athletic budget. Whereas the rest of the schools in the PAC 12 are getting like 30. And so there would be a massive inequality there. And I think there'd be a lot of animosity. And so what you're saying in theory, I think would work really well where hey, football, you guys go do this, you know, basketball, maybe if you want to do something, but the Olympic sports stay in your region where it's easier to travel and where everybody kind of values the same thing. Um, that would work, I think, on paper, but I just don't know if you could actually leave. And in doing so, you have to think, USC and UCLA suck a ton of cash and bargaining power out of the Pac-12's media rights deal. And so I think a lot of people are looking at that now like sour grapes. They don't want to be a part of that. And like I said, in theory, it should work, but we're dealing with human beings and not robots here, and I don't know if that they could be able to coexist in that manner. I'm curious about how you view the value of Oregon. You uh, you retweeted a, a, what I find to be a fascinating nugget. Since 2000, Oregon has more AP poll appearances and top 10 AP poll appearances than every Big Ten program except Ohio State, including USC. And I think with that, Oregon, you know, as far as recently, last 20 years, they've been pretty darn good. They got a lot of cash that's sunk into them. Phil Knight obviously has poured a lot in there with Nike. Their facilities are unreal. They have a small local market, but I think there is a broad national appeal to uh, Oregon. I would equate them a little bit to almost the, the hurricanes of the 80s and 90s just without the national championships. They've been in those games. They've been on big stages. They have the sweet uniforms. Everybody knows them. It's it's a relatively small market. And I know Miami's a big market, but it's not a college football market. You know, so, but they didn't necessarily have that big local following to pull from. But nationally, people like to watch Oregon. And so I do believe that there, there's a lot of value there with them, despite the fact that you know, Oregon's not a very big state. There's not a whole lot of fans, but they do fill up their. St- Here's what I want to know like, what's the passion? Oregon doesn't have the biggest stadium in the world, but I think there's first or second right behind Washington or Utah, right around in there where uh, the the stadium capacity percentage is near the top of their conference, where they only have a 60-some-odd thousand-seat stadium, but people fill it up, man. They go, they care, it matters to them, as opposed to even at USC, where the Coliseum, yeah, you may get 65,000 people in there, but it's a bad place to watch a game, I get it, but it still holds like 90, and you're telling me you can't get more in there than that. That's kind of mind-blowing as far as looking at it. So Oregon, I do think there's a lot of value there. And hopefully my mind, like I would love to see Oregon and Washington join the big 10 pull in Stanford, pull in Notre Dame. And I think you've got a pretty good deal uh, going right there. And until probably the ACC is fractured here in five years when their media rights deal is easier to break. Bobby Carpenter, our guest. So Bobby, it's one thing when Nick Saban goes and says, starts whining about, you know, uh, these guys are getting paid to go there and I'm competing against this when he's making the plea for businesses to step up and help his program. Is it unfair of me to think that Mark Stoops is headed for a downfall when he is whining about now having to compete against players who are getting paid more than his guys while he pleads for local business in an interview with Kentucky Sports Radio to step up and help him because his program is behind when it comes to that? Well, I do think that there is... uh 
he does have momentum on his side right now. If you look at Mark Stoops, what he's done at Kentucky over the last five years, I mean, they've been on a pretty nice trajectory of success and had a pretty nice year last year. I think they're set up and positioned well to have success in the future. And, you know, he's got to be realistic. Like, you're in Lexington, Kentucky. Like, it's, it's a decently decent city. I mean, there's obviously a lot of money that comes in there from the horse racing industry. Like, you have opportunities. But all of these coaches, I mean, I, I was sitting there, Ryan Day, it's at the – the Central Ohio Auto Dealers Association, all of these guys, like all the head coaches, they want to make sure that they have enough. And it's enough to not for the big NIL deals for some of these guys, but to make sure they have an opportunity so that everybody that comes in, they're getting their quote stipend of whether or not that's 25,000, 35,000, 50,000, whatever that number is, every recruit that comes there, this is what we can offer you baseline and now over and above that's going to be on you and maybe the position you play. But I, I think all these coaches are doing this. Anybody who's actually trying to win and feels like they have a, a good chance of getting some of these recruits, you just have to be able to put it on a level playing field. So I don't I don't view it as whining. Like I, They're pitching. They're out there trying to let people know the problems. And if you like having a good football team and you want that success to continue, these are the table stakes, and you're going to have to help us to get involved. So Hutton and I are both very curious about this uh, 24-7 list you retweeted of the most intimidating stadiums for 22, for 2022. A lot of people on their Twitter bio put, you know, retweets are not endorsements. So I'm particularly curious if you're endorsing this list, which has Clemson number one, Ohio State number two, and UT Tennessee number three. Is this a concession? that Clemson is better than Ohio State as a, as a stadium venue this coming year? So, first of all, I've never been to Death Valley, so I, I try not to judge stadiums that I haven't been to. I've watched it on TV. It has a lot of juice. Um, I mean, I'm obviously partial to Ohio State. I don't have any more room in my Twitter bio to put anything else where retweets aren't <laughs> endorsements. People can take them kind of however they want. I think it's the retweet is just helping to put out more information, um, as opposed to you know whether or not you can read a teleprompter correctly, and you know, I may share something like that that I think is funny. Maybe it's an endorsement. Maybe it's just the sharing of information. But you know, ultimately, as far as where we're going with the stadiums, like there's a lot of stadiums on that list that I would say are very accurate. You can reshuffle that thing and kind of move it around, and everybody's obviously going to be partial to their home stadium. Um, but I, I mean, I haven't been to Death Valley. There's a lot of places in the SEC I have not been. Um, a lot of places out west. I haven't been as well. So I try to refrain uh, from judging other schools when I haven't been uh, to one of their games. Like I, I promised one of my friends I'd go to Baton Rouge for a night game because they, they say it's the best night experience around. And I've, I've played in a couple of night games, I think in pretty great environments. So I want to see that to kind of be able to put it against it to kind of see where we're at. Bobby, uh, let's go to year two of you in the NFL. Rookie dinners were a topic that we had on the show a couple of weeks ago. And you sent me a text afterwards. I think it came to mind like, oh, I've got an epic story about year number two and a rookie dinner that you attended. Um, I'll, you have the floor, sir. All right. So because the, the topic came out about you know rookie dinners, and I believe Tory Smith was the one that said it's terrible, bad financial literacy. We're teaching you know, bad habits. And, it's, and I, I defend it. Like, it's, it's a rite of passage. And guys can pay. First round draft picks can go pay 10, 15 grand one time for a dinner. And it's up to the vets to not take advantage of them. And I, and I kind of outlined how the guys threw some cash in for us, the offensive line, you know, on their offensive dinner, they usually have five or six grand. They would throw to the rookies. They wouldn't tell them, but they'd give it to them at the end of the night, you know, as long as they did some stuff. Um, but my second year, Anthony Spencer, we had drafted, he's drafted in the first round out of Purdue outside linebacker. You know, he's coming there competing with me, but I like Spence, man. He was a good dude, and I had good vets that took care of me. And so, Spence, we literally ride to our rookie dinner together. I pick him up, take him down there, live down the street from me, and we're sitting there at the end of the night. And all the, and it's tradition. Everyone but the rookies, they all get up and leave. You know, they, the guys, they see the bill coming. Everyone's like, all right, guys, you know, we'll see you at the club or see, you know, see you tomorrow, whatever it is. A lot of times you go out and you have a drink or something afterwards, but you get up and everyone walks out. So I'm, I'm staying, I'm still sitting there because Spence is I'm his ride. So I'm just going to wait. So he takes his credit card out, puts it in you know, the envelope, gives it to him. They kind of divvy it up. You know, his was $10,000. 
And I'm like, all right. And I was like, dude, I'll take a grand of that for you. Like here, and I put my credit card in there with it. So the, the, the server comes back. She's like, sir, your, your card has been declined <laughs> looking at Anthony. And I'm like, you mean, he's it's like, he goes, dude, it's, it's good. I, I just got it. I go, when did you just get it? He goes, I got it this morning. Oh. I'm like, wait, hold on. I was like, this is the first charge you're trying to put on? He goes, <laughs> like, bro, they're not letting you put on a $10,000 Nick and Sam's bill. Like, that's getting turned out every time. So I was like, I look at him and he's like, all right, dude, like, I got it. Just pay me tomorrow. Bring me a check. So I, I eat the, I eat it, you know, buy whatever it was. I think it was 10. I go, I'll put it all on here. He goes, Spence, give me a check for $9,000 tomorrow. So I, I, next day he comes in, forgets the check. I'm like, come on, Anthony. Like, dude, it's, it's not, I'm not starving over here, but I don't want this to linger into like week six and I'm still asking you for nine grand. So the next day he brings in the check, gives it to me. You know, we're, we're busy running around. My wife's like, hey, leave it on the counter for him. Like, hey, cash this check tomorrow. This is before taking pictures and all that stuff. So she goes to the bank and the bank looks at her like, we can't take this. And I say, like, what do you mean? And she goes, he never signed it. Oh, and I'm like, I'm like, you have to be kidding me. Go back to Spence, like, That's a Costanza stall pack. <laughs> Here's the thing. It wasn't even, it wasn't an intentional thing like Costanza. I'm like, Anthony. Have you ever written a check? He's like, no, dude, I just got this check. <laughs> I'm like, my goodness, man. Like, we're going to, we have to sit down. We're going to walk ourselves through these paces and kind of understand what it's like to be an adult. I go, what would you have done if I wasn't there? He's like, I, I don't know. Called my agent. I'm like, that's this pretty... is where we are. But that's, those are like the good stories, man, of like where but it ultimately this goes. This is the and opposite like... of what Tori Smith was saying. You were actually yeah. educating him in, in a good way. On finance, first saying. charge and first check, ten grand. Yeah. I, I, exactly. I could have been a jerk and walked out and be like, get your own ride home. But it's like, dude, you're, you're a friend of mine. You're a teammate. You're a good dude. Everything's all all well and good. So, I mean, it it, it ended up being fine. And, and honestly, one other quick one. I know you guys are trying to get out. My third or fourth year, I would I went to the offensive rookie dinner as well. Roma went and were good buddies, all the offensive linemen. So we go there. They drafted a guy named Doug Free. He was the highest drafted player that year and i think it was a third rounder because jerry had traded away the other picks for roy williams we bring him in and they're hitting him up and they're the offensive linemen are you know pressuring him hard it may have been even the same i think it was the next year and anyway and um they all of a sudden one of the guys pulls out he's like all right here's the fine money from the year before that they have little fines in their rooms it was like six thousand dollars and the bill was like 10 or bill was like probably 20 and yeah, I watched it, it one of the guys, 10, but take... the defense decided to show up too. <laughs> exactly. Well, just me. It was just me. And I, I didn't listen. I'm not hurting those guys. I watched them take a whole little tray of hot lobster butter, dump it into a goblet. They fill up a water goblet all the way. They take a piece of uh, New York strip fat that they had been cut off. They garnish the side of it, and they look at Doug Free, and they're like, "We'll give you the fine money if you drink that." <laughs> <laughs> my man Doug is from Manitowoc, Wisconsin, small town, like big grizzly bear, hunter, fisher, and he just looks at that, he's like, all right, and takes it. Before anybody can tell him it was a joke, it was just to see if he would, he starts chugging that lobster butter, dude. It's coming out of his nose. <laughs> oh. Witten has the weakest stomach in the world. Witten's like looking about to gag, and then you see him hit that piece of strip steak fat, and he's... <laughs> <laughs> it like chokes it down. <laughs> Witten had to walk out of the room. He's about to throw up all over himself. And we just look like and Mark Mark Colombo, our offensive tag goes, dude, I was gonna give you the money anyway. <laughs> like, I didn't think you actually drink it, but dude, like you're good with us. Like anything you need, we got you. How now. did he recover Amazing. from that? I, I he said he was fine. I go, dude, I want you to take a picture of the toilet the next day because <laughs> you might be able to light it on fire. You had so much oil in your body. That's what we tried to do with Chad whenever he tried to eat beef heart. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. Same, same reaction. <laughs> it's a disaster. Same reaction. I, I, uh, also, I documented uh, that. Strangely enough, this was like 20, 2017, but I also had a phone that didn't take pictures at that point. <laughs> so I was the same problem you had way back when, Bobby. Bobby Carpenter has been our guest. Always great catching up with you, man. Uh, maybe this weekend you'll see Top Gun for a fifth time. No, he did. Oh, a sixth He's time. up to six now. Yeah. He's It'd be it six. Times. I don't know if I have that much time. I finally I think saw five. Hey, Bobby, He's real, real quick, uh, I've got Top Gun news here. Um, there's discussions about a sequel to Top Gun Maverick, officially. That is confirmed by Miles Teller, who said Tom Cruise called him to discuss it. And Miles Teller says it is totally Tom Cruise's decision and his alone if there's going to be a sequel. 
How about that? If they do it, it's got to be good. And that's, and I think Tom right, knows that. Now. Thanks. That's what I'm saying. The check will be big, but I don't think Tom needs any more money after this. He wants to do a great movie. He's not going to do a garbage sequel. So if he does it, I'm trusting that it will be good. Probably not as good as Maverick, but I'm thinking it'll be pretty solid. Bobby, thank you. Have a great weekend. See you, Bobby. Take care. Uh, thanks, Bobby guys. Bobby Carpenter, our guest. A new album that will make Chad's 2022 the most joyous year of his life. I'll explain next on Outkick 360.
Outkick 360 rolls on. I uh, found out yesterday, Chad, I was watching. I don't know what I was watching. They were promoting this. What were you watching? Uh, it was an ad, this? that, but it, it was a music show. Okay. Um, I'm here to tell you that you will have a new Christmas album oh, yeah? this year from Backstreet Boys. The first and only Christmas album from the Backstreet Boys. For those that don't know, Chad... He's loves a boy band Backstreet guy. Boys. And I mean, uh, he'll tell you totally the affinity serious. for it. I was at a concert two years ago. It drops October 14th with three original Christmas songs plus what you would expect on a Christmas album. New classics. A very sure. Backstreet Christmas is the name of the album. <laughs> what do you hope's uh, on there? A little drummer boy? What are your favorites? What I hope. Oh, come on, you faithful. <laughs> is that they, of course, Oh, the Holy standards. Night. Oh, Holy Night. Yeah. It's McLean's know, favorite song. Silent Night. I love Oh, Holy Acapella, Night. Acapella, Silent Night with the four boys, now men, together singing. <laughs> now uh, now men. They've been men for like 25 years. <laughs> they were men years. when they were the Backstreet Boys. Yeah. The one was like 27 when they hit their stride in like 98. Some boys. Um, but I also hope that they hit hit it big with a Mariah Carey-esque original. Oh, a new that classic. That becomes a standard. That's, yeah, one keep of the three. dreaming. Uh, that's, all that's three. My hope. All want, three. Don't, one don't, of the three. I don't want cut one the of these three. Short. I want one of these three to become a new Christmas standard. Oh, I expect all three to become Where a Christmas Where we hear it, we think, it's like hey, Sinatra. doesn't feel like Christmas unless the Backstreet Boys are singing that song <laughs> yeah. that came out in 2022. I'll give you some odds on that. Well, I mean, who would have thought Mariah Carey would have had a classic that she's had? I wouldn't have thought, she's but I would have thought, thought more than Chad's, Backstreet Boys. Chad's children will have the Yuletide cheer with an original Backstreet Boys Christmas song. Do you think oh, the Daddy, pitch Christmas isn't complete without the pitch Backstreet was just Boys? This simple, guys. Here's what we're gonna do: male version. All I want for Christmas is you. Boom, money maker. Let's make this happen. <laughs> is that what the Backstreet Boys went to their management and said? We have to write that song. We need to get in the Some studio. Some male version of that this June to record these Yuletide classics. They and are back, own. and they're gonna keep coming back. The Backstreet Boys. Do you this think thing. they're busy? No. Like when they have to like get together to record, that someone. Well, I don't know like, if I can fit this in my know, schedule or not, guys. Right I mean, they tour, but when they're yeah, not they, touring, yeah, they've been anything? on tour. Well, Chad saw them recently. I did. It was a packed house. Oh yeah. They're doing very well. Packed house. How, how big a house? Uh, Bridgestone. Somebody's Bridgestone house? Arena. <laughs> it was Bridgestone Arena sold out. Skyler Callahan joins us next, talking Carolina Panthers and the acquisition of Baker Mayfield, and the deal that. Carolina reportedly originally wanted Baker to take. That's next.
Bills linebacker and Franklin, Tennessee native Tyrell Dotson will be with us in 20 minutes as we broadcast live from 6th and Peabody. Hour number two of OutKick 360 across the OutKick network. Big news this week in the NFL. Baker Mayfield traded to the Carolina Panthers in exchange for a 2024 fifth-round pick that could become a fourth-round pick. And Baker's taking a $3.5 million pay cut. The Browns are paying the majority of the salary. In fact, they'll be paying Baker Mayfield over $530,000 for the week one matchup as the Browns take on the Panthers. Over five hundred grand of that salary will be from the Browns paying the Panthers' potential starter. Uh, with that, we say hello to Skylar Callahan. He covers the Carolina Panthers for SI Now. Skylar, good to see you, man. Hope things are well. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm appreciative of uh, you guys having me on. It's, uh, it's a crazy time. This, this stuff just happened all out of nowhere. So <laughs> tell me the reaction from Panthers fans based off of... I'm, I'm expecting... I think I know how the answer goes here. Sports radio talk in Charlotte and beyond had to be craving Baker Mayfield via trade to Carolina, given the quarterback situation. Um, the fact yeah. that they actually land him this week, what's been the reaction from the, the Panthers fan base? You know, surprisingly, it's it's been a little bit of, of both. You know, you, you see a large proportion of the fan base that's kind of upset because they didn't want to bring in another guy that's going to potentially get them seven or eight wins, and then all of a sudden they're not going to be, you know, going after one of those top quarterbacks in next yeah. year's draft class. To me, it, I don't think this roster, even with Sam Darnold a quarterback, is bad enough to get one of those top two or three quarterbacks. Like, I, I just think there's way too much talent at the skill positions and on defense as well. And everyone forgets, too, the offensive line has been dramatically upgraded, too. So – I just don't think that it would have mattered. And I think if anything, this is Scott Fitter and Matt Rule saying, let's let's compete. Let's ha give ourselves a chance to maybe sneak into that last wild card spot in the NFC. Um, what, because I don't think you can do that with Sam Darnold. With Baker Mayfield, you have a chance. And again, if he doesn't work out, it's $5 million. You gave up a fifth round, maybe a fourth round pick two years from now. It, it's, it's a cheap deal that the Panthers did, a, a lot cheaper than what they did against Sam Darnold. Is there any legitimate competition going into camp between Baker Mayfield and, and Sam Darnold, or is this simply being handed to Baker Mayfield with this move? Yeah, I mean, it's it, there's going to be competition, but I do feel like it's it's going to be Baker's job to lose. But one of the things that stuck out to me a while back when we first talked to Ben McAdoo when he arrived was that he said Sam Darnold was one of the things that kind of uh, intrigued him about this job. Now. <laughs> Take that for what you will, but if you remember back when Sam and Baker were coming out, Ben McAdoo had Sam as the third rated quarterback in that class. He had Baker at number six. And Sam's been in this offense for a couple of months now. He's been in, you know, through OTAs and many camps. So he should have a little bit of an advantage over Baker. I mean, that's just how it is, just because of how long he's been in, in this system. So uh, he's got more familiarity with the, the skill receiver or the receivers, the running backs, a little bit of the offensive line. So I would expect Sam to maybe look a little better, a little bit more sharp than Baker in those first couple of weeks. But I would say by the end of the preseason, you'll see Baker take that step and, gra and grasp onto that number one spot. How does Matt Corral fit into all this? And does this guarantee that they're going to carry three quarterbacks on their roster? Yeah, it's it's an interesting dynamic because, I mean, and for some reason, I don't know how, but I think P.J. Walker will end up finding a way to stick around too because whether it's practice squad or, or what, it seems like every time that he's on life support for his job, he finds a way to stick on the roster. I think that's just the, the history he has with Matt Rule. But, I mean, he, he he probably will be off the roster, Let's if we're being honest. But as far as Matt Corral goes, like, I, they were never sold on him being – somebody that could really push Sam for that starting job in year one. And that was something that Scott had told us uh, back maybe a, about a week or so after the draft that like, look, we want to have somebody that can push Sam for that starting job. That's what's going to make him better is someone that's going to really be pushing him every single day. When you have PJ Walker, and Matt Corral, there, there's nothing there in terms of, you know, some sort of competition. So I feel like getting Baker Mayfield in here is going to help Sam and really, whoever loses this job is probably going to be a backup for the rest of their career, for being completely honest. DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, Terrence Marshall look like a, a pretty good 
top three uh, receiver group. Um, we know um, a- a- Anderson had to walk back some, some things he said about, uh, about Mayfield, <laughs> uh, which seemed reasonable that he was supporting um, Darnold uh, at, at the time. Also, there had been some rumblings a while back about a potential trade there. What's his state of mind there? Is he definitely a part of this team going forward? There are a lot of teams that need receivers whose fans are hopeful that he'd be on the market. I can't see why he would be. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the Panthers have any interest in trading him or, or letting him go or anything like that. I think the, the 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 biggest thing is, does he still want to play? I mean, we we talked about the, the retirement tweet that he put out there and then later deleted. And he kind of brushed it off when, when he met with us at OTAs. He's like, no, nah, I was just kind of thinking out loud. It wasn't anything serious. But, I mean, obviously there had to be some sort of thought for him to actually put that out on Twitter, right? So I, I don't know where Robbie's mindset is. It seems like he's ready to go. Um, to me, I just thought it was a little odd that he didn't show up for, for OTAs. I mean, he skipped out on him last year. And I understand that. But for this year, you're coming in with a whole new offense. And, you know, I would think that he would want to be there to, to learn that offense and get valuable reps in that offense. So I wouldn't even be shocked if somebody like Terrace Marshall uh, maybe overtakes him as the number two receiver at some point, And maybe even Rashard Higgins, who was with Baker Mayfield in Cleveland. So I don't know what we're going to get out of Robbie Anderson this year. I think it's going to be a kind of a mixed bag. It might be a little bit of what we saw in 2020. And it might be some of what we saw last year when he had some struggles with the drops and stuff too. But according to Matt Rule and Ben McAdoo, there's a lot of things that he can do in this offense. And they're going to use him sort of how they used him in the offense two years ago with Joe Brady. As big as the Baker Mayfield storyline is, the thing that probably tells the tale of if the Panthers are semi-legit or not is Christian McCaffrey's health. What's yeah. what's the forecast there? And, and and for a guy that's broken down as much as he has now, what's the realistic expectation for him to have a, a complete season now? As of right now, he's he's 100%. Um, I wouldn't say he's a full go in terms of practice and stuff, but when, when they do let him go, he is at 100%. So they've been holding him back. They did a lot of different things with him during OTAs and minicamp, really kind of holding him back from really going full speed. And there was a lot of times where he was standing off to the side and not really doing a whole lot, just being very careful with them. And that's pretty much what they're going to do in the preseason as well. I don't even think we're going to see him take a single snap in preseason action. I think it would be kind of ludicrous to even have him do that anyways. But I think as long as he can get through that first half of the season and they can sprinkle in some touches here for for Deontay Foreman and for Chuba Hubbard, I think he's got a chance to get to 14, 15 games this year. And maybe perhaps he goes back to the way he was before, where he he was extremely reliable, extremely durable, and and plays every game. I mean, I think a lot of people forget those first three or four, or those first three years that he was in the league, he never missed a game. And even going back to his college days, he was very durable. So maybe this was just kind of a little bit of an anomaly, a little blip in the radar, but I think having someone like Deontay Foreman who can take the, those those carries off of him in short yarded situations is going to help out a lot. Now that Chuba Hubbard's got a year in the system as well, that should benefit him, benefit him as well. Skyler Callahan, our guest with allpanthers.com. So David Tepper and the job he's done as owner with, with the Panthers. Skyler, what is the temperature right now with the fan base in regards <laughs> to ownership and David Tepper? Is, is there obviously not pressure on an owner, but – are the fans satisfied with what's been going on under his guidance? Oh man, <laughs> it's been crazy. I, I don't. I, if you really want to know the actual answer, just go into a couple of Panthers Facebook groups, and you'll see about three or four posts on him a day wanting him to get out. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I would say, yeah, the, the pressure is on for him to find a way to win. I mean, you, you talk about not only the the lack of success on the field, but you're talking about. The, the practice facility down in Rock Hill in that situation that just absolutely blew up. He promised that this big, nice, shiny, you know, state-of-the-art training facility was going to come to Rock Hill. They get $170 million worth of steel on the ground, and now it's just sitting there. The deal is completely dead. So I, I don't know what the future looks like for David Tepper as an owner, but, I mean, I, I feel like at some point he may get a little impatient and make some moves that you, you – 
don't expect normal owners to make, but he has the money to do it. He's the richest owner in the NFL. So I think that's why you saw the Panthers in the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes. And that's why you saw, you know, him go pay the enormous amount of money that he did for Matt Rule, even though he wasn't an unproven NFL coach. He wanted to go get his guy and it ticked off a lot of people around the league. You feel like there's there's a risk of that team being the next one that uh, that seriously threatens a move, given given the failings of that that uh, practice facility development you're talking about, how he handled that, and and with the stadium question probably coming here shortly. Yeah, I mean it's a possibility. I mean I think David Tepper's such a bright you know businessman. I mean he's had a lot of success throughout his career. Um, just being able to find ways to make a lot of money. And whether that's moving the team, whether that's, you know, just continuing to stay where they are at Bank of America and, and just kind of continuing to keep up with updates there, you know, he's going to find the best way for the Panthers to be successful, whether that's moving them or keeping them there. But I don't think there's been really any sense of this team moving. And I think a lot of that kind of went to bed whenever he started Charlotte FC. Now that the, now that the soccer club's there, I think he's really kind of, you know, planted his feet into the ground here in the Queen City. I, just, I think he really likes Carolina. So I don't, I just don't foresee a move happening. If anything, they may move the stadium across town, but I don't, I don't see anything happening. There was some talk a couple of years ago um, when they, when they were beginning the, the Rock Hill plan that maybe that's where the stadium was going to go. Obviously I think he's, he's made a lot of people mad down there. So that's never going to happen either. Did Joe Brady get a raw deal or did he earn that midseason firing that he got a year ago? You know, I, I thought at the time of the hiring, it was a questionable hire. And, but I understood it. You know, he, he's bringing a guy with him that's from the college background that's got a lot of, that just had, you know, obviously one of the best success stories in college football history with that offense he had at LSU. So it was hard not to want the new flashy thing, right? And I think that's what a lot of the NFL is trending towards is who can get out ahead of the curve. And maybe I think they jumped the gun a little bit. And I think Joe Brady did the same thing too, jumping the gun in terms of he skipped a few steps on that coaching ladder. You know, I, I think he could have maybe been a, a group of five head coach at the college level, maybe even an assistant or a quarterback's coach at the NFL level. But to go from not even 100% running the LSU offense to running the Panthers offense in the NFL, that's a major, major step. And I think he, it kind of humbled him a little bit, but I think he's in a good situation now, obviously with you know being in Buffalo with Josh Allen, being the quarterback's coach, he's going to get another opportunity to be the offensive coordinator somewhere. Just, I mean, when you have that, that type of offense and that quarterback with you, your name's going to start floating around. So we'll see what, what happens with Joe Brady. I think he's going to be a fine NFL coach down the line. I just think he, he may have jumped the gun a little bit. We know Matt Rule is on the hot seat. They've got to make this work. And uh, the report from the, the Athletic saying that earlier in the offseason, the Panthers wanted Mayfield on a reduced salary to maybe give up even as much as $7 million. Of course, we know the reports that he gave up three and a half on the money. Uh, but it was Fitterer and Rule who wanted to get the deal done back in the draft. And it was Tepper yeah. who said, we're not going to overpay for a depreciated asset. That's coming from the report. Um, I find that really interesting because this is an owner who continuously talks about a franchise guy. That's why Sam Darnold is there. That's why they try to get Deshaun Watson. And they've been in the mix and mentioned for other potential free agent quarterbacks or trading for a quarterback in the league. Stafford was mentioned, for instance. He ends up in L.A. Rodgers has been linked to Carolina. We know he stayed in Green Bay. They didn't want Baker unless for the right price. And I find that really interesting given the thirst for trying to land the next guy. Yeah, I mean, again, David Tepper is – he's getting to the point where he's growing a little impatient. I mean, when you go out and try to get Deshaun Watson and that whole situation that, that's going on with him, I think even if you just entertained that situation, I think you're, you're a little bit in, in desperation mode. And, you know, for, for whatever – value that he that he could have got out of you know the Deshaun Watson deal I mean no one knows exactly what the parameter the parameters of a deal with Houston may have been it could have been Christian McCaffrey and some picks it could have been Brian Burns and Jeremy Chin and some picks it could have been JC Horn but I, I don't think he would have completely overreached for Deshaun Watson I think that's why they backed part of the reason why they backed out the, the biggest reason is because they didn't want to give any guaranteed money away 
But when you get to this point of the off season, right, and you're two and a half weeks away from the start of training camp and you're still with Sam Darnold, P.J. Walker, Matt Corral as your quarterback room, that's not going to make you feel good, especially when you go back and look at how last year transpired after, you know, what was a, a solid start to the season. So I think David Tepper at the time, maybe at the draft, was was more, you know, wanting to go the patient route. When you get to this part of the year and the season's upon, right around the corner, you're going to do everything you can to make a deal happen. So I understand why they, they went after Baker. It, it gives them a chance to compete. Does it make them a playoff team? I'm not 100% sure that, 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 that that's what's going to happen with this. But if anything, it's going to give them a chance. With Sam Darnold, you don't have a chance. Are you surprised that there weren't any other suitors for Baker Mayfield other than Carolina? Yeah, you know, I, in a sense I was. I, I thought Seattle would have been a, a definite – you know, landing spot for him for whatever reason. I think they're just kind of set on tanking or, or whatever you want to call it. But um, even Indy, before they went after Matt Ryan, I thought would have been a decent spot for Baker. And there's a couple other spots too. But, you know, Baker Mayfield, I mean, when you look at what he's done, when he's healthy, he's not a bump. Like, he's a, he's a pretty decent starting quarterback. If the Panthers can get Baker Mayfield to be a Ryan Tannehill or an Alex Smith, that's all they need him to be. They don't need him to be this top five, top seven quarterback in the league. When you have the, you know, the, the weapons that he has around him, like DJ Moore, Christian McCaffrey, and then really on the other side of the ball, you have one of the better young defenses in the league that's only going to continue to get better. So to me, it's a lot like what Scott Fitter was a part of back in Seattle, where they had a really good defense and an elite running game and a quarterback that was maybe, you know, I, I might catch some flack for this, but I think Russell Wilson was above average, and I think he was kind of carried by that defense and by those that, that running game. And, yes, he, he's a great quarterback. Don't get me wrong, but I think he gets a little too much credit for that success they had during that little mini run that they had in Seattle. But, if, the, if again, if Baker can be an Alex Smith or Ryan Tannehill, I think Carolina has got a chance to really build something in the next four to five years. Allpanthers.com, the website where you can find Skylar Callahan's information and reporting. Skylar, we appreciate it, man. And uh, we will uh, catch up down the line. It'll be a storyline to follow for sure at the end of the month. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you guys having me on. Thanks. Skylar Callahan. Um, so August 4th is the Hall of Fame game. We are crazy. <laughs> here it is July 8th all of a sudden, less than a month away from... Uh, the Hall of Fame game in Canton, and it's Vegas, and I can't remember the other team. It's Las Vegas and another team. There you go, the Raiders, and w another tie-in, I'm sure, with uh, Hall of with the Hall of I'm Fame class. Think. So, um, and then from there, a week later is when everything else gets going for Week One of the of the preseason. So we're about a month away from the first preseason game. Coming up, Tyrell Dotson will be in studio with us. Bill's linebacker is on deck. Plus, later, Austin Price of AllQuest.com. This is Outkick 360.
Glad you're with us. Friday is here. Outkick 360 rolls on from 6th and Peabody with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. Uh, it feels it does not feel like that long ago that our next guest was winning the Mr. Football Award uh, right down I-65 at Centennial High School for Coach Brian Rector. Tyrell Dotson is in the house with us. Uh, A&M linebacker, Centennial uh, player, standout player, one of the best in the state we've ever seen, and now with the Buffalo Bills. Good to have you in studio, man. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. I'm excited to talk about stuff, you know. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah. yeah, you walk through Sixth and Peabody here. What what's your impression of this place? Now packed it is on a Friday. Oh uh, yeah, I mean it's kind of crazy. I mean people out there drinking live music. It's kind of crazy out here. I've never never been here before. I'm I'm definitely coming back. Much like a Bills pregame party that you can't take part in because you're playing, they start early here yeah. at Sixth and Peabody. So. They start equally early. Yeah, we, we we just need some tables out there so people can jump through them. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no tables will be harmed tomorrow <laughs> at your football camp that we know of. Uh, at Centennial High School, starting at 11 a.m., yep. your alma mater high school here in the mid-state. Uh, really cool that you're giving back this way. This is the second year you've done this. Mm -hmm. Is this something you want to continue? Yeah, so me and Chris, my marketing agent, we're doing it every year. I mean, even after football. So, I mean, I just started my foundation, too, so... Yeah, so we're going to do it every year and, and more and more. So I, I have a couple more things like um, turkey drives on Thanksgiving and like toy drives on Christmas um, that I'm going to be doing. So I'm excited. I'm excited, yeah. My, uh, and you live here in the off season, correct, yeah, in Nashville? Yeah, I live in Nashville. My 12-year-old's doing a baseball camp at Centennial next week. You got any keys or cards to get them in some, some back doors? <laughs> I will air call, condition, I'll, special air conditioning oh, rooms? Geez. I will call Coach Balfour and the head coach there. and Just tell him you yeah. know Tyrell. Yeah. I yeah. think no, it's no, Centennial it's, it's, and you're, you're good to go. Yeah. I got the keys to the city, huh? He'll appreciate he'll appreciate the hookup. I, I'm yeah. fear it's gonna be a little hot out there for kids playing baseball, but he's excited. Yeah. So, so Tyrell, I, I have now, as of this year, I've been to both an A&M game and a Buffalo Bills game. And I've been to three Bills games. My brother-in-law is from Hamburg, New York, which I'm sure Hamburg. you're familiar with. Yeah. Very close. We stay in Hamburg. We go over. He's a huge Bills fan. Yeah. Um, two of the more unique environments for football that I've ever seen. I would say the Bills environment is the closest to a college football environment that you can get in the NFL with the big layout, with a huge parking lot, tailgating, everything else. And Hutton and I were at A&M for the first time this year. That is very different. Very different than anywhere else you'll go to in the SEC. Would you agree with that statement? I, I would agree, but my friends make fun of me because I've never had cheerleaders a day in my life. Because <laughs> yeah. A&M and the Buffalo Bills don't have cheerleaders anymore. But, yeah, I mean, the Bills is crazy. I mean, it's our practice facility and then our 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 game, our game, our, our game field. And, like, I, I know the Titans, you have to drive and stuff like that. So, you get you get it all in one and stuff like that, so uh, it, it, it's pretty awesome. What's the excitement level about the new uh, the new building and um, outdoor maintaining outdoor football there, but an updated venue is long overdue, right? Yeah, I need uh, a couple guys aren't too happy about that. I think guys need an indoor field. <laughs> <laughs> so is it is it really an advantage? Like, do you feel acclimated to the weather? When you're up there, you, you live here in the off season. Yeah. I'm sure – I don't want to knock Buffalo, but I've been to Western New York. It's, it's pretty in places, but I'm assuming most of your teammates live somewhere else in the off season, Like Miami and stuff like that, they yeah. Don't, they don't make Buffalo their permanent home. So you're there long enough to feel like you have an advantage yeah. playing in the cold? Yeah, and, and Coach McDermott makes sure we practice outside. There's, there's a lot of older guys that – cry during the week like when we're outside it's cold and stuff like that but um it's definitely advantage guys i mean teams when they come in they definitely don't want to they don't want to be there how long did it take you a southern kid who played in texas in college football how long does it take you to get acclimated where you feel like okay i'm cool with this weather now i'm still not used to it <laughs> i'm still not you were used one of the guys it. complaining about the not having the indoor facility hey listen i'm not a vet yet i'll be a vet this year so when i reach the vet years you know you got to your stripes i start complaining then Did you just figure you're more used to it than the guys <laughs> who are coming in yeah yeah i mean yeah you should see people they they're like freaking big coach trench trench coach at practice and stuff like that it's 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 insane well i mean that and then the the wind 
Oh, um, yeah. yeah. The game that this past year that comes to mind with New England. Zero degrees, right? Yeah, yeah but yeah. the wind itself was yeah. affecting the game more than the cold was. Yeah. Uh, and that's something you just cannot practice with. You cannot manufacture that type of weather. We know that the focus was on the quarterbacks and the, the run game. It, what was it like as a defender in that game? Oh, I loved it because I knew they were running the ball. Every time. Every time. I loved it. <laughs> my, coach, my coach is telling us, me, Tremaine, and Matt to back up a little bit just in case they do play action. Me, Maine, and Matt looked at each other like <laughs> – yeah, well, no, we're getting up there because <laughs> they're gonna run that ball. Yeah, so, it was yeah. like, oh, maybe yeah. this would be the possession where they attempt to pass. You I, know? I, did you guys nope. do air quotes? Like, yeah, play action. All right, sure, yeah, got yeah, you, coach. No yeah, that's action. gonna happen. I think he threw the ball. Mac Jones threw the ball three times yeah, that game. Yeah, and what he's one for three or two for three in the game yeah, or something. Some, probably something zero for three. <laughs> yeah, probably zero for three. I'm yeah, I'm playing. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then uh, the, the other game that comes to mind is the overtime game at, at Arrowhead. Uh, where they literally changed the overtime rules based on the result of that game and the two quarterbacks dueling in that. Um, yeah, you were part of a classic game yeah. there, no matter the result, which sucked because Josh yeah. Allen was on the sideline for it as the game ended without getting another possession. But in the postseason, we're not going to see that result again where Allen would not get a possession if he's second out. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just to flip the twin calls is the outcome of the game, you know, and that was a crazy game. I was – Gabe Davis – went crazy that game I mean I love that game I mean and just special teams we had a good game too so I mean um I'm looking forward to playing them again next year without Tyreek Hill <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah but see I was gonna bring up so Tyreek's not there but we face him two times now right right and yeah. the that's 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 also a great point but the, the thing about Kansas City in that particular game is Mahomes and Kelsey where they're they're cha they're literally changing a route at the line of scrimmage mm -hmm. um where you're not Based on what your film study tells you and where Kelsey's lined up in the down and distance, you guys are probably thinking one thing. Yeah. And by one glance over at the quarterback, based on the relationship, they end up making the play of the game. Yeah, there's a lot of miscommunication. Yeah, so. Oh, so you'll still blame the defense? No. Oh. You're saying miscommunication on your end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, it's just, yeah. So. It, it, explain that. Is, is it's that just, is, it's just not, every, not from pregame prep, but like yeah. you're reading it during the, the game. Moment. It's just it's just everyone needs to be on the same point. I mean, on the same you know on the same page at that at that point in time, you know, and just um, all, all eleven guys got to talk. So, you know, I don't want to get too much into it. Yeah. But, you know. Well, it, it's also uh, Josh Allen to me is, and I mean this is a compliment. He doesn't feel like a big time quarterback in that his personality. Doesn't seem like a superstar, right? Even watching him in the golf match, I'm thinking, this guy, you could tell me this guy is fighting his way into the league or he's a you know a practice squad quarterback somewhere. He doesn't have the same vibe as Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers, right? And I say that as a compliment. Is he truly an everyman in your locker room? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's why he's so successful because he doesn't take it too seriously. You know, um, yeah, I mean, Josh is a big kid. He doesn't take anything serious like – if he asks you a question, do not answer it. Because it's probably going to be D's nut, a D's nuts question. I'm being honest. Like, I don't answer questions for him. If he asks me, I just walk away. I, I turn, I turn my back to him. You know what's coming after that. Yeah. Are he's you, also a really big dude. Oh, he's huge. He's like 6'5", like 250, 260. Do you, do you see a guy like that and think you could play a different position? Or does he – he has the athleticism. I think to Josh play can play tight else. end. He can play tight end easily. Are you conscious of what the Jets and the Dolphins have done – this off season, kind of in pursuit of you guys? Um, not really. You know, you know, every game is NFL. You got to come bring your best ball every single time. I mean, Jets have gotten better and the Dolphins have gotten a lot better just with adding different pieces and stuff like that. But it comes down to your coaches. Like um, my college coach told me, it's, it's, it's not about the X's and O's, it's about the Jimmy and Joe's, you know. Um, so it, it comes down to that. And who, who's going to make a play when it's time to make a play? So, um I think we have better coaches than anyone. So I think we get that advantage over them. Tyrell Dotson, our guest. How cool is Von Miller? Von Miller's cool. We, me, and Von, me and Von have been friends for uh, about five years because I at a and and stuff like that. He, he texts me and, you know, give, gives me wor words of encouragement. And uh, to be in the same locker room, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. I, I, I never thought – I thought he'd be retired by now. <laughs> he does seem older than what he is. Yeah, he's 32. Yeah, and I would have guessed 35. Yeah, yeah, earlier in the week, whenever the, the story came out about how he wants to play all six years, which it's difficult to do that mm -hmm. in a contract. Um, but his, his, I mean, his ability to manufacture uh, pressure on the quarterback, even if he's not getting to the QB, he's affecting the line of scrimmage 
to the point where other guys are, are making plays. He did it at Denver. He did it in L.A. And he's still doing it at 32, headed to Buffalo. Yeah, he, in, in practice, he's – he looks like I've never seen him practice, so I was like, I'm curious to see how he practices. And it's like kind of like Spider-Man low-key, like the way he moves, the way he can bend the corner, the way like he drops in coverages and yeah. some of our pressures and stuff like that is, is kind of insane. He's like a unicorn. Did Jimbo Fisher going scorched earth on Nick Saban surprise you, or did you just nod your head when you saw it and said, yep, I could, I could see this one coming? Uh, Jimbo, yeah, I knew that. I, I knew once Nick said something – Jimbo was coming back with something 10 times harder because Jimbo, he loves arguing. <laughs> One thing about Jimbo, he loves to argue. Yeah, he said he loves confrontation. Oh. I mean, he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll confront anybody. Bring it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, him, I, his first couple months being at A&M his first year, was like, I'll, he, so he, it was kind of tough. So does he come in and try to, like, set the tone in yeah. a, a certain way where it's just noticeably different than whatever Sumlin was doing? Most definitely. No music at practice. Coach Sumlin, oh, that's a, yeah, that's a first. No music at practice. He said that was his, like one of his first things he said. No music at practice, and we, were, we looked all looked at each other like, "What? <laughs> You're crazy." Well, did he go? You know, Ed Ogeron famously, when he took the job at Ole Miss, ripped his shirt off in front of everyone and challenged <laughs> anyone to a fight that would fight him. He said, "If you want to fight me now, is your chance. Let, let's fight." <laughs> Nothing like that with Jimbo Fisher. He just shut the music nah. off instead. Jimbo, Jimbo is gonna just talk all day long, and he's gonna be in your face. He he probably won't rip his. He, you don't want to see him rip his shirt off. <laughs> no, <laughs> nah, you don't want to see Jimbo rip his shirt off. But Jimbo, Jimbo likes to talk a lot of crap. Was that as different as you could be from a uh, cultural atmosphere standpoint? Going from Kevin Sumlin to Jimbo Fisher it over your career, it was a whole three six. It was a oh one eighty. It was kind of crazy. Like I've, like it, it, it was honestly insane. Then just like the the knowledge that Jimbo had that I didn't learn from Sumlin, it was kind of it, it was like a, it, it was it was pretty cool. Your favorite A and M memory playing there? You, you racked up a ton. Uh, you led the team in tackles, I believe, your sophomore season. Yeah, um, seven overtime game versus LSU. Yeah. That was a me- that was a memorable one. Yeah, uh, was that the day after Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving night? The, I think the day after. Yeah, I think it was. Day, I know it was Thanksgiving yeah, weekend. I, I was, remember watching the game, but I can't remember if it was on Thanksgiving night or the day after. Yeah, it got to a point where our defense, I was calling the defense, and I told them, "Do not look at me for a call. <laughs> we're running, we're running this call the whole entire time. So don't look at me. I'm tired. So yeah, so that that <laughs> game is definitely a, some some to remember. That that I mean the seven overtime. That was the was that the record prior to this past year with Penn State and Auburn yeah, going nine. I think it was. They went nine. They went nine technically, but they changed the rules though nine, of the overtime. So two point conversion battle. Yeah. So they they Crazy. they tweaked the rules. It was a bit different than the one you played in because they try to speed up the process after three overtimes. Chad, I believe, is the new rule. They, yeah. They line you up and it's just one for one. You Alternating go, two point conversion. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was wild in that Penn State. So yours Illinois is game more. Yours is a more impressive yeah, I, duration. We can contest. still look at yours as the record yeah. holder officially for the so longest game. That was nine overtimes. It was. Nine. I gotta go back and watch that game. Yeah, but it was. It was technically. It was not like your game though with overtimes. Like the nine overtimes, just one play. Oh, you know, it got to be just one play back and forth. Every offense and defense and it was, was all matching two point conversions until someone didn't. Oh. Get the to get the score. That's interesting. Yeah, it's it, I, I like it better that way, in that it's it's quicker for the most part. But they don't have enough two point conversion plays, so it got kind yeah. of vanilla. <laughs> hey, it's like you guys running the same defensive uh, set. Do you think it's just a matter of time before A and M wins a national title I under they, Jimbo Fisher? I think they got it this year. Really, with that quarterback situation, do you think they have it? Oh, Zach! Zach left. I yeah, Calzada's know. out. Let me take. Well, my, and the, let me uh, take the, I don't know. And and they've got the guy from LSU coming in. Right? Johnson, right? Yeah, Miles Haynes Johnson. Haynes King is yeah. pretty good, though. Doug, Haynes, Doug Haynes Johnson's son. Yeah, uh, and uh, Haynes Brad King, though, Johnson. got hurt, though, right, at the beginning of last year. Yep, Calzada yep. comes in. With the game we went to the first time in College Station was the Alabama game. How how crazy that was that? That was unbelievable. And he was on the field for the – he was with Manziel. I was standing sideline. with Johnny <laughs> you were with Johnny? I was with – because of Billy Lucci. <laughs> I know Billy. Me yeah, and Billy. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. sure. Lucci Billy guys, knows everyone yeah. in College yeah. Station. But Billy got us on the sideline. Hutton was down there for maybe the second, third quarter. Yeah. I came down fourth quarter, and I was. Standing, I brought Chad my pass. I said, "Go down there. You're going to love, love this. The, you'll love this, Tyrell, because I'm standing right behind Johnny Manziel. There's three minutes left, <laughs> right? And I mean, A&M is driving to win this game. Yeah, and it is tension packed in the stadium. <laughs> and Billy is such a nice guy. He's like, "Hey, man, you got to meet, got to meet Johnny. Got to meet Johnny Football. Come on." 
come on up here. I'm like, I don't know that now's the time. <laughs> and I'm standing behind him just, you know, hanging out, letting A&M people experience the moment. And he taps Johnny Manziel on the shoulder and says, hey, this is my buddy Chad with, with OutKick. And we meet, and Johnny Manziel's polite as can be. He goes, hey, I'm going to just check out the rest of this game right now. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> and I said, buddy, I'm not trying to talk to you yeah. right now with, with this game. It was unbelievable, Yeah, the atmosphere. That that stadium gets gets going. Were huh? you able to watch that on TV? Mm, yeah, we, we were actually somewhere. It was a we were actually somewhere getting ready for a game, and oh, I'm glad you reminded me. Stefan Diggs owes me a thousand dollars because of that game. Nice. Thank you, thank you. For so that. between them, right you. when you walk out, did you out bet the, the to, week of or just leading up to the game or during the game? Did so, you place a bet? So he gave me a spread. He was like, um, Alabama's going to win by 21, and I was like, <laughs> which we thought too. What? <laughs> Whatever. A and M's winning national championship this year. But he gave you twenty one points, and you won he gave me twenty one points. Bucks? Yeah, nice. he's got a damn big contract. You will say that. <laughs> well, you're you're welcome. That we you charge him interest if he hasn't paid you yet, man. Uh, yeah, what's the delay? You should have got some juice day? for the money line win Jeez. for winning outright with a tw- with twenty one points given to you. Jeez, there's a, there's a lot of bets I haven't been paid in our locker room. So you got a bunch of uh, cheap skates on that team. Uh, That's what I'm hearing. Well, unless he, I want, I unless he owes some, do you owe money? No, no. <laughs> my, my credit is good. My credit okay, is always okay. good. My credit is always good. Uh, so what is the uh, what are the next two and a half weeks like as you gear up for camp? Camp will be open soon. We mentioned right before you walked in. I mean, the Hall of Fame game is August fourth. It's Less July eighth. Uh, it's not like guys are taking many vacations right now, no. but you're getting mentally prepared for the grind that yeah. starts in three weeks. Yeah, so uh, me and Dawson Knox and Bryson Hopkins, we go uh, four four times four times a week working out these next two weeks, and um, and then Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm with my speed coach, and he kills me. You know, I literally tell him today, if if you guys saw my Instagram, I had my eyes were red and it looked like I was I was dying. So that's basically my next two weeks and uh, hanging out with my family. Because I probably won't see them until, you know, they come up to a game, you know. So um, I'm going to yeah, grind in these next two weeks. But it starts with the football camp tomorrow, second annual. Yep. We say annual because Tyrell is going to continue this thing year after year. Centennial High School, your alma mater, mm-hmm. down in Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, everyone's welcome. Yeah, Kids yeah. want to come out and take part in the camp. You can show up tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. Yeah, really you, cool. Yeah, you can show up. I mean, if you want to come watch, you can come watch. We're going to have food trucks there. Um, Hall's Chop House. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Two, That's a good spot. They donate 200 meals. Uh, uh, if, yeah, wow. if, you, if you promote that, you'll have some people walk up and watch. <laughs> yeah, so we we have Could shaved. you cut three of them out of that and bring them over here to us? Uh, hey, sorry, listen, guys. <laughs> listen, we, we might have extras come over, come, yeah, coming over. I but may have to do that. You know, I, I'm grateful to see how all these sponsors that want to help out with my camp. And, um, yeah, so I'm just grateful for that. Wait, we'll, we'll help out each year with you, man, yeah. uh, here, here locally. Just let us know. This has been uh, terrific. Pop in, and then we can promote uh, well in advance of all this to get yeah. some sign-ups going locally. This is great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks for giving back to it. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. I, I appreciate you guys for having me. And make sure Davey gets all the camp info. We'll be sure to tweet it out. Okay, also, yeah. And post on Instagram for so sure, people man. can see it. Yeah. Tyrell, on the way out, um, or the Bills right now, according to FanDuel, are the, the Super Bowl favorites, betting odds. Are you <laughs> used to that, or? Yeah, yeah, we're used to like being the number one like preseason and stuff like that. But we gotta go out there and work, you know. Defense, defense has improved. Josh Allen's back. Uh, plenty of reasons. You mentioned you've got uh, Davis and others who stepped forward at the end of last year. I'm telling you, Gabriel Davis is looking better than anyone. <laughs> he better than anyone in that uh, yeah, championship it, game. I'm, know that. I'm talking about better yeah. than anyone now in, in in that whole facility right now. Wow. I'm telling you. Well, he's like a fourth-round pick, third or fourth-round pick. Third, third or fourth-round pick. And he's either ending his first contract, kind of like you, or he's he's yep. getting ready for contract number two, maybe. No, he, he's um, – He's in the second deal? No, he's in his third year. Okay. He's in my third yeah, yeah, year. Same as you. Yeah, I'm in my fourth year. I signed a um, – One-year extension? He wants to one-year extension and stuff like that. So. Well, best of luck to you, man. Thank uh, you, man. It's a big year coming up, and uh, it, you certainly uh, played your role well in Buffalo. Yeah. And it's – I mean, it's – going to pay off that you guys have a built a really solid roster there as you know yeah so i think thank you guys for having me man this is awesome we gotta yeah. do this again thanks for doing absolutely it. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it certainly next year let's before we uh before the camp yeah let's do it tyrell dotson has been our guest as he goes to text stefan diggs about the one thousand yep. dollars we had to break we'll take a commission on that for the reminder with an all-time hockey guy name withrow's got it for you next and outkick 360.
Our thanks to Tyrell Dodson for joining the show. Outkick 360 rolls on from 6th and Peabody. We keep telling people you got to come check out 6th and Peabody the next time you're downtown. Tyrell's from the mid-state, middle Tennessee area, had not been here, popped in. One of the first things he told us was, man, I, I've got to come back here. This place is crazy, especially on the weekends. He lives uh, two miles from here, if that. He's uh, just a few minutes away, so he's got he's to check it out. He'll be back. Everyone is pleasantly surprised. That's right. Not a single person that's walked in this place the first time that does not leave pleasantly surprised with Six and Peabody. What's not to like? Yeehaw beer, Old Smoky Moonshine made right here on site. Chad, um, you are the you're the lucky one on the the three of us who somehow followed anything to do with the NHL draft last night. And when I say anything, I saw like this name. Even even a tweet, I, I saw nothing on the NHL draft. No, I saw what the Preds did. I just I haven't been upfront about it because I'm somewhat ashamed. Oh, <laughs> well, I, you're ashamed to know. I was listening to uh, just on Twitter, ninety four nine the fan, our. our uh, station here in Nashville and you flip over to the game and I was I was listening to what they thought the Preds might do and they the conversation was whether or not they actually trade out of that pick they didn't they stayed and picked I can't tell they you did who they did exactly selected. what you expect they took another Finnish guy they they selected <laughs> if a, we were predicting we would have said that I selected right? a guy who I'm sure is very good but no one can tell you he's uh, a, f- a Finnish forward yeah, about that's it that's what I know that's about that's what him. the Preds do yes. but so I see that name and I'm thinking nah I can't tell you anything about the guy I see this name that Chad sent us last night, and I think, this guy can play some hockey, and I would take him in a fight. Chad, your thoughts on what you thought the first time you saw Rucker McVorty? Round one, pick 14 <laughs> to the Winnipeg Jets. The Jets select from Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh. Right winger, Rutger McGrorty. <laughs> what a fantastic name. This guy sounds like a villain in the Mighty Ducks franchise. Yes. Yes. I mean, that is an unbelievable – there are certain names that when you hear it, it's, it's almost like God touched, right? Your parents came up with this name. You're born into the McGrorty family, and you give the kid the name Rutger, and he becomes a hockey star drafted in the first round. It's too perfect. It's like Cleet Blakeman. Who was yes. the, the referee? He was made to be involved in football in some way. Do yes. your wife's kin know this gentleman? Uh, being in Nebraska, no, uh, the, the know, McGrorty family. Ne- Nebraska is a big, big state when it comes to <laughs> land. Not a lot of people in it. So they're good. That'd be like uh, someone of... from Knoxville. You know, said, "Do you know them? You're in Tennessee, no, right?" No, no, that's Do not we know because him? there are no people in Nebraska. Well, there's people in Lincoln and there's people in Omaha, and there's not a lot of people anywhere else. My wife's people are from the anywhere else <laughs> <laughs> portion of the state. Three hours from Lincoln. Two and a half, three hours from Lincoln. Just a stone's throw, Just Chad. north, uh, but it's in the land of not a lot of people. That's a good name. I just looked up top hockey names, and the, the name I came up with before this guy, the top of the list was Zarly Zalapsky. That's good, too. Which is also good. So I'd like to see them meet. I also feel like Rutger McGrorty. I know he's a young guy right now, but I feel like he can really drink. Oh, he could drink. Like a name like that, like th- that's the das guy's like. I hope he won't develop a yeah, problem. Yes, this he guy can is drink going so to do well. the beer fest games in Germany he at could, some point. He could drink so well, I fear he'll develop a problem. <laughs> no, I just, I, I just think it's more of like the fun. Like, man, did, did did you see Rutger? How many beers he put down last night? And it, you couldn't tell a thing. No, I picture he was completely fine. See, oh, I picture that's, if his that's career. That's just McGrorty. Be McGrorty. I picture if his career oh, doesn't go McGrorty. well, like we'll walk in every day and he'll be sitting at the bar out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your latest? Oh, moonshine? he knows. He knows. Uh, he knows six of Peabody I'll so have, well. He's got a key. I'll have your finest moonshine, please, ma'am. Thank you. Rutger McGorty is an all-time name. Just terrific. I saw that and had to send it to the group that we had to discuss today. It's perfect. Dotson was cool. Uh, big thanks to Tyrell for for coming in studio. We've got Austin Price on deck to kick off hour number three. Uh, we will get headlines from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Also discuss uh, SEC. Uh, movement and and headlines and news and notes with Austin as well. Uh, But when we come back to kick off hour number three, specifically, we will start with the five-point plan at Tennessee and how the leadership in place, they're not shying away from high expectations. No, they're setting them out there for everyone to see. So if they don't reach them, people can call them a failure. But I love the fact that they're honest enough to admit what they're trying to accomplish 
Uh, we will get to the five-point plan, but first, an A-plus tweet, oh. courtesy of College Football Reddit. Breaking, in all caps, Batman and Superman plan to leave DC Comics after an 80-plus year run with the publisher to join Marvel. They'll leave behind traditional rivals, but the media deal is expected to be massive. <laughs> That is very, very smart. It's oh, pretty good. With college football and, movement. And the, the price tag for all of that, given the fact, like hypothetically here, of course, given the fact that there is a movie made on Batman or is it Spider-Man? Batman and Superman. Superman. Uh, other than Spider-Man, there's no other uh, comic genre to point to that is remade more. Yeah, well, uh, even from total, the Batman, even from the Batman aspect, you can spin off with the Joker. Obviously, a total joke, of but course, really funny yeah. with the news going on. They'll leave behind some traditional rivals, but the media deal is going to be perfect. Hit us up on Twitter at Outkick360. Outkick 360 rolls on, getting set for the top of the hour hit with Austin Price of VolQuest.com.
Final hour is here. Outkick 360 rolls on. Sixth and Peabody, our location with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. The crew is all here as well. And every Friday at this time, we lead off the final hour with VolQuest.com and Brent Hubs and Austin Price. Today we get Austin Price is back in the house with us. You can follow him on Twitter at Austin Priceless. Right around the corner, two weeks away, less than two weeks away now, for uh, SEC Media Days, the unofficial kickoff for what will be a fun SEC football season. Austin, good to see you as always. Uh, great to see you guys, and uh, good to be back on uh, after uh, being on vacation the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, you know, y'all y'all may love it because you're, you're, you're radio guys, you get on Radio Row, and you kind of have that constant stream of, of uh, coaches rolling in there for yep. basically one-on-ones. For us, nah, I, I could care less. I, if, if they if they never did SEC Media Days again, I wouldn't cry. How many rounds of golf did you play during this lengthy vacation? Well, how was Idaho? Also, nice golf courses in Idaho. Uh, no golf, no golf. Uh, we did Yellowstone, we did the Tetons, um, you know, and then I drove down from Idaho through Idaho into Salt Lake City to uh, fly back to Knoxville. So, uh, but the Yellowstone did not disappoint. Um, yeah, it was really, really good, and uh, you know, it, it, you know that the animal experiences, guys. I equate it to like that first Jurassic Park movie. And like, oh, this this type of saurus, and then they wait, and it's not there because it's an animal, and you can't <laughs> predict what an animal is going to do. That's kind of how that stuff is. You, you know, one day we watched wolves hunt a elk, and then you, you know, the next day you don't get anything near that cool. And then those wolves hunt you on that same day as you, uh, as you go out there to watch them. Congrats uh, on surviving. Yeah, uh, survival of the fittest out there, no doubt. Um, Tennessee doesn't just plan on surviving, Chad. Uh, they plan on leading the pack so, to, to tie in the, the wolf pack analogy here. Danny White, leader of the wolf pack, uh, leader of the pack, put out a five-year plan. And uh, Austin, I was really surprised. And also, I, I was... Uh, it, I love seeing this from Danny White. He legitimately just put out, we want to win this many conference championships every four years. We want to win a national championship every five years in these sports. Here's what we are setting out to do. I don't know that I see things being that exact in terms of wins and losses when athletic directors, leaders of organizations put out something. It's, it's usually about the process more than end results, right? But Danny White's not shying away from expectation when he puts that out there. Uh, I don't know that it makes his, all of his coaches overly happy when they see that, but what did you make of this five-year plan from Danny White? Well, you know, I think that's great to have ambitions and have goals, and, you know, I don't know how realistic some of that stuff is. Um, you know, obviously Tennessee wants to win in every sport, right? I mean, and they've done a really nice job of being way more competitive and in winning in some cases, whether it be – the Tennessee baseball regular season, Tennessee baseball and the SEC baseball tournament for Tennessee baseball, the SEC basketball tournament, uh, you know, tennis, you know, golf's been there uh, competing uh, at a high level for the last few years under Brennan Webb. Um, you know, a lot of the sports are trending in the right direction. Uh, soccer being another one, uh, even though they just had the, the coaching change with coach Pinsky leaving one to, uh, to Florida state, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I, I think it's more about just having Tennessee, back amongst the conversation the title conversation in every sport and so for my for my liking you know i think you know all that stuff that you know they kind of laid out is important um i also think nil is important i also think you know i mean to me you have to find a, a really steady balance of you know making sure your you know facilities are not out of date and old and corroding and not making them the Taj Mahal because at the end of the day, you also need um, these donors, you know, not only given to the building fund, but also to the NIL fund because that's going on across college football. You see every day coaches, you know, pitching for their fans to give, 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 um, you know, why is that? Because it's an arms race. And right now until they adjust, if they're able to adjust in any way, I don't, there, there's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube but can they have some type of reform where it's, you know, you've got a cap on things. See, I think that's even hard because how do you tell one kid he can make this and another kid he can make that? Or how can you say, hey, you guys are capped at making this? I, I just think that that's really, really difficult without getting the federal government involved. And I think they've shown that they 
are going to have to be a free for all when it comes to this stuff. So I just think it's a happy balance. You have to find a way to do what you want to do from a facilities and an athletic department standpoint while also doing the NIL thing as well. Well, and off field with this and what Danny White said was there are issues around attendance all over sports, and it's not really getting better in a lot of places. But he pointed out that he thinks that Tennessee's an outlier when it comes to that from his time there and what he's seen with attendance figures and attendance rising in many cases in sports at Tennessee. Do you buy that? Do you think the increased attendance goals for uh, season tickets at Neyland Stadium, is that a realistic goal for Danny White in Tennessee? I don't know why it can't be, Chad. I mean, the more you win, the more interest you're going to have. It's kind of like recruiting. You know, somebody said, what's Tennessee's chances with Boo Carter, the, the, the athlete out of Chattanooga? And I said, I mean, I think Tennessee's got it right now as good a chance as anybody. At the end of the day, if they win games, they're going to be a lot more attractive to every recruit. Um, same thing, you know, in, 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 with what you're talking about. You know, the, the more, you know, you kind of have success, the more, you know, people are are going to come and whether that's in baseball whether that's in basketball and, and definitely in football football is, is always going to be the bell cow here this is a football school will never be anything but people can say baseball school or basketball school all they want at the end of the day i see the metrics on our website and i think that small dip of it is on a grander scale um, you know, with the interest level of people. I mean, I think basketball and baseball are sports that, you know, Tennessee fans love. They love to follow. But at the end of the day, if you said, hey, would you rather have a national championship in baseball or win the SEC in football? Something tells me they'd choose the SEC in football a lot of times just because Tennessee's not been there in so long. I mean, they haven't played for it in 15 years, 2007. They've not won, a, won one in, you know, over 25. You know, with time this thing was around, be 20, 25 years since 98. So, you know, I think Tennessee fans covet and they crave and they they just have a hunger to be good in football again. And so if you give them a reason to, if you win some games, those season ticket sales are going to go through the roof. Austin Price, VolQuest.com, our guest. We, we know and we knew going in, wherever Arch Manning landed, there would be a recruiting waterfall right after. Um, and, and so I guess what has happened at Texas is no surprise. How would you describe the recruiting waterfall – after Nico's announcement for Tennessee and the effect that it's had on the recruitment process to this point? Yeah, I mean, I know the New Sentinel wrote their article today. It didn't make much sense to me. I mean, to stick with people that follow recruiting, um, at, at the end of the day, you know, you, you've got to factor in, like, who, recruit, who, who committed after Nico committed? Who visited after Nico committed? Um, you know, I mean, you can look at Caleb Herring. You can look at several of those guys that committed in the spring. Since then, even a guy like today, like Sham Yumarov, the offensive lineman, talked about how Nico hit him up before his official, all the way through his official, has talked to him ever since then. You know, Nico has been working Cam Seldon for several weeks now. But everybody wants to point towards two guys, Carnell Tate and Francis Mauingoa. Well, Carnell Tate was going to be a tough boy, even if you had landed Carnell Tate. I said this a few weeks ago. Like, I think 25% chance you actually signed Carnell Tate. Because Ohio State was not going anywhere. And then Francis, I mean, it just comes down to, you know, I mean, he felt comfortable in Miami. And, you know, I mean, you know, NIL is always going to play a, an important part in this thing. And, I mean, you know, you just have to, you know, weigh what's important to you as a class, you know, I'm, uh, for each school does or each collective. And so, you know, I, I think when you look at, you know, what Nico's done, he got Tennessee in the game with certain guys that they probably wouldn't have been in before, Francis being one of them. Um, didn't, did not, didn't, they did not land Francis, but uh, it continued to be great. And if he has success on the field, his impact will be felt in future classes, fours, 25s, because kids will want to come and play with someone who's charismatic like Nico. So, um, you know, for me, I, you know, I look at what Arch Man did. That's good. Texas got Arch Man boat, and then the kids from Texas to commit stunned that Texas got Texas kids to commit. I mean, that's only been going for what a hundred years. I mean, like most kids in that state that play for Texas, you know, or, you know, end up, you know, falling at some point to the Longhorns, um, you know, even with their recent struggles. So, you know, but most of these schools are going to have success when they get a big time quarterback, Tennessee, Texas, look at Oregon, Oregon got several big time commits before Dante Moore got in the boat. Um, but, you know, you know, schools are going to have success to recruit. 
with all this potential uh, school movement in the conference shuffling, um, we read somewhere this week Tennessee, you know, and a lot of schools with their objections to to this school potentially coming to their conference. We read somewhere Tennessee's big objection would be to to UNC. Not that anybody's objection would stop anybody coming to a conference if that's what was going to happen. Do you think Tennessee would have an objection to USC? No. To UNC? No, I don't, I don't. I don't think that would be the case at all. You know, I mean, I don't think Tennessee would have any objection to anybody coming in this conference. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, like Tennessee is one of the few states that have two teams uh, from their state, that being Vanderbilt. You know, Auburn and Alabama are together. Mississippi, Mississippi State, Texas, Texas and m But like forever, you've always heard, you know, Florida didn't want Florida State to come in the league, or South Carolina didn't want Clemson to come in the league. Um, but no, I don't think Tennessee would have any opposition. I mean, I, don't, I really don't understand that Tennessee's not recruited North Carolina hard enough the last several years, even though they should, um, you know, they've not recruited it uh, to the point where like, you're like, Oh my gosh, that's going to, you know, cut into our recruiting uh, ties in North Carolina. I mean, I, I've not heard that at all and would be just flabbergasted if that were the case. Well, and I, I immediately think, and it was from swim swam who mentioned that yesterday. It was the same report where all the four schools it's were mentioned. where you go for all your swimming yeah. and conference expansion news. Swimming and swamming. If you didn't know. Um, the, uh, the, the thing I, I think of is, okay, like they have issues, like just like Texas A&M had issues with Texas. What difference did that make? Which way did they vote when it was time to vote? Like, it, yeah, not, it's not universities matter. can have all the issues they want. If the SEC wants to add schools, I sure. think we've learned based on sure. last year, Austin, they're going to add schools. You know, if I were Tennessee and, and and I was going to have an issue with, you know, a school potentially coming in, it'd probably be Clemson just because you can, you know, Clemson and Tennessee touch each other a lot more from a geographical standpoint and it not being that far from the two towns than Chapel Hill in Tennessee, you know, or Virginia Tech for that matter. But I mean, I don't, I don't see Tennessee having an issue with anybody. Tennessee in recruiting yesterday and today. You mentioned Umarov today at offensive tackle. How big are these two additions offensively for the Vols yesterday and today? Well, Chad, I mean, when you look at it, it, we'll start with Sham. I mean, you have Aiden Bustle in the boat, the kid from Mount Juliet. Now you add Sham. Tennessee's going to keep swinging at Lucas Simmons. He's going to commit on Monday somewhere. I think it's Tennessee or Florida State. Um, and, and then we'll see what happens with Stanton Ramil, the young man from Alabama. Uh, I think he'll do something later in the month. Tennessee, Michigan State, kind of the top two for him. But you needed to add more offensive linemen, but you, in particular, you need to add tackles. And that's what these next three guys are, are tackles. Yesterday, Cam Seldon, I said it on Twitter, he's a cheat code. I mean, he, he can play a little bit everywhere. He can play running back. He can play wide receiver. A lot like Debo Samuel. Um, but he's a tank, though. I mean, he's 6'1", legit 6'1", not 6'1", on paper, and 5'11", really. He's a legit 6'1". But more importantly, he's 220 pounds and he runs, you know, what, 10 7. You know, I mean, the kid can really move at a kid 220 pounds, state uh, 100 meter champ in the state of Virginia. Austin, July 4th behind us, and you know what that means. It's Christmas time in the Price household. <laughs> oh, ho, ho. that's right. It's time. Let's get that tree up. Where is it? Oh, it'll be put up till October, guys. <laughs> Come <laughs> right on, right before guys. Halloween. Right before Halloween. Although treat. my dad, my dad just went into retirement. We want to do, we would do want to wish Craig a, a happy uh, retirement. Yeah. Um, and and he, he's been telling me for the last couple of weeks, he's going to have the Christmas tree up super early this year because he's in retirement and he can. So, uh, so I'll be interested September. to see when he breaks out his, his Christmas tree. Yeah, it could be, it could be September. I think your 4th of July gift to your dad for his retirement should be the Christmas tree that you take to his house and put up for him today, <laughs> like right now or over the weekend. <sighs> I'll, I'll I'll pass. Austin and the family they love Christmas, uh, like we all do. But they they love Christmas so much that the the decorations are up super early, but not early enough for them. The to each his own. Um, Austin, thank you as always, man. Always great content at the site, and look forward to next week's visit. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. There's Thanks. Austin Price, VolQuest.com. Uh, he and Brent and the entire crew there do fantastic work. Um, coming up, more headlines to hit, uh, including a free agent watch for the NHL that if you're in our listening area, if you're listening to the show right now, it matters uh, for some smaller market teams across the NHL. I'll, I'll explain that. Plus, 
Paul watched the Yankees Red Sox uh, game last night. No big surprise that he was watching the game, but he was watching for one specific thing in the batter's box. That's next and now kick 360.
Outkick 360 rolls on across the Outkick network. Paul, I may be getting my nights confused. Was it last night or the night before where the Yankees came back and won over Boston after a good pitching outing? Or was there one? Last night they were uh, they were up big and gave up a lead. Okay. Okay. And then Devers so last hit two bombs. He, he, Devers has hit six home runs off Garrett Cole. He, he just owns them. Uh, the, the, I always kind of gloss over whenever the announcers are like, this, this guy's never faced this pitcher. Because I'm also thinking like, well, this pitcher has clearly never faced this hitter either, right? Yeah. But the, the hitters who have great success off guys, you can tell uh, starters that are, play. They are pitching them different than the guy that was just at the plate, he no could, matter who it is. Cole could do nothing. I think what you're talking about, I think the Yanks lost to the Pirates 2 nothing. then they came back and beat them 16 okay. nothing. Okay. with two grand slams. Then they had a grand slam last night. They had three grand slams in two nights. Not so bad. you were you were watching um, the the batter's box specifically last night. Yeah. So for a column, uh, what my intention was, I was going to put a stopwatch on guys stepping out of the box. And you guys know how I hate Velcro. Uh, I was going to downscore guys who yeah. stepped out and played with their Velcro. The the problem is, there's not a, a consistent enough shot of what the guy in the batter's box is doing. And in hindsight, what I should have done is really time the pitcher. A time between pitches to get a sense of how much wasted time there is in the game and compared it to the proposed pitch clock, which is probably coming in next year. What I ended up doing is using the, the TV shot as best I could for guys stepping out of the box. So one of my favorite baseball players of all time, one of my top five Yankees, Hideki Matsui, never got out of the box. He just got in the box and stood there. He didn't waggle. He didn't move. He just was a quiet stance, and he stood there. Giancarlo Stanton does that. He, he gets in, he's got a, a stance, he gets in there, he doesn't move. Uh, unless he fouls the ball off, he might move a little bit. He doesn't reset his feet, he doesn't dig, he's very quiet. Um, and I appreciated that. You know, that's, I, I wasn't counting a guy stepping out of the box if he put his back leg out to be out of the box to look for a signal, you know? To reset. Yeah. But I was getting a general sense. Did a guy wander out of the box? Was he taking time? Now... Would the pitcher have been ready for him if he was in the box, if he walked out? I don't know. It's a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Mm-hmm. My wish is that they both just would be ready quicker. Um, but I counted up. The Yankees left the box 20 times last night by my count, based on what I could tell from the telecast. And Completely the Red Sox, leaving the box. Well, leaving the box enough that yeah. it would have it prevented some... the game from going ahead if yeah. the pitcher was ready. More than just looking for a sign. And the Red Sox left the box 30 times. Um, so... But I didn't feel like it slowed down the game that much. I don't, the, the pitcher wasn't necessarily ready to go. Would the pitcher have been ready to go if the batter was ready to go? Oh, let me, can I phrase it this way? I don't know. Would it have slowed down the game if this was Yankees and A's and not rank Yankees and Red Sox for you? I don't, I think yeah, because Boston, I would have been more thing, compelled by this game invested, than that game. Yeah. Well, I don't know because I was very intent on watching this game for that. And from yeah, that, it was you were doing kind of a homework assignment, watching right. it. Let's put up my up. work. I, I just just so you can see what I did. We have here's what I did. So that's every batter in the game, and I was not. Yeah, it looks like you know, a, it looks like you're uh, logging the game right. up in the uh, press box. So I was counting. <laughs> you know, z- how many times has this guy left? I would put down the number. I would also put some V's for Velcro incidents. So the worst guy uh, to me. Um, uh, if I could find uh, the well, one of these this, guys up top says four times. It looks like. Well, LeMahieu? Um, is that number at first base, LeMahieu? Well, no, I also put slashes at the end of the inning to keep track of where things were going down. So some of that could be that. So um, really, I thought the worst defender overall, and, and the biggest slowdown of the game was John Winkowski, the starter in the fourth inning for Boston, walked a couple guys. And he had a base runner obsession and strike zone complaints and a catcher conference. That, to me, was the one thing that slowed down the game the most, a frustrated pitcher who was going through a bad inning. He ultimately got out of it. But that, to me, if I had to pick out what slowed down the game most during the course of the game, was that inning for him. Um, and the, the other thing here, I thought... Um, By the way, I think I liked your piece, and it's interesting to see what guys do what in the batter's box. I think pitchers are way more to blame. Yeah, I do, too, after, for, for after watching play. it. There, there are countless times where I'm thinking, is this batter going to call timeout 
because this pitcher's taking so long to get signals. Nobody called time stand out in there. last night, from what I could recall. I, nobody I, I called I very time rarely out. think, man, I hope that pitcher just throws it in there if he's got one foot in the batter's box. This Boston this guy's catcher, so Kevin Plawecki, who's spent seven years in the minors and has had, he's had many minor league at-bats as he had major league at-bats. He got cut away from a lot. <laughs> Ninth hitter, I don't think they were as interested in his, as showing. He stepped out at least six times. The, the primary guy stepped out eight times. But he was constantly tugging at his gloves. He did the double Velcro after every pitch. Uh, I'm not kidding when I say they, they have to eliminate that. It's just a, a bad, purposeless habit. And now almost every guy wears uh, a sliding mitten. That um, yes. they're, not, they're killing time on the bases, fastening and unfastening the sliding Mitten. But again, do we really think the pitcher is going to be ready to throw a pitch in the time that guy's putting a sliding no, mitten on? No, and that's why, as I, much I as I all love circles around the pitchers taking I way do too, long. and that's why, as much as I love it being an untimed game and a nine inning game, I think you put in the pitching clock and get the guy moving, and then maybe you don't need it later. But here's one thing, and this was my kicker: Dave Stewart was in here, what well, inside the last two months talking mm-hmm. to us, and he said in his day. After the game was over, everybody hung out in the clubhouse together rehashing the whole game, right? And he said, it's not like that now. Everybody gets the hell out of there. So I'm thinking if guys want to get home to their families or get out clubbing or whatever it is they do, why aren't they compelled to play fast? Like, why wouldn't you be compelled? Like, hey, we're going to put in our work and we're going to play intensive baseball, but we're going to play it faster because we want to get the hell out of here. Part of it, though, I think is... At least whenever I'm I, – I, I, over the last two weeks, I've been watching a lot of baseball because of FanDuel. But the, 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 the issue I see is the gamesmanship that goes on with trying to get a pitcher ready in the pen and that pitcher on the mound deliberately – taking as much time as possible. You have the catcher come out. You have the pitching coach. I didn't say that, that wasn't happening last night. The um, Red Sox used but that's six a, guys. But that's a way, like, to me, with the visits to the mound – there's a way to get around the pitching clock if, in fact, you're trying to really bog down the game that I just don't think you can get away from based on the way the game is structured. Well, pitch, I still like, think the it'll... The pitch clock for the first five innings is cool, but, like, the grind really happens between six and nine. And what's the ideal length for a baseball game? Two and a half hours? That's what it was in the 70s. It was about two and a half hours. Last night was three, 302 or 304. Average this year, according to baseball reference, is 307. That's down from 311. I don't really mind a three-hour baseball game. It's well, the, it's that the ones that go the over. I mean, the average. That ones is that you mentioned bad. 307. That is the like within 60 to 120 range. seconds. That is within range of what the NFL optimum game three time game. is. That's why the halftime is 12 minutes. That that's why they're kicking off right at 1202 Central, and they want that game ended by three o'clock. Uh, 245 is awesome because they can go around to the other finishes and then join the 315 or 320 kickoff central, I'm talking. But 307 is perfect for the league. If it's anything over than that, that then they're freaking See, out I, about I it as an average. A, I don't mind a three-hour, seven-minute football game once a week when your teams are playing once a week. Three hours is too long for baseball. Well, I also think this. It's too long in a season of 162 games. Give me better stuff inside the 307, right? And we've talked about all these issues. There are more foul balls than fair balls in an average baseball game now, which is ridiculous. And you get the three true outcomes where it's a strikeout, a walk, or a home run. There's not enough action. And I don't know what the solutions to those things are. The shift certainly well, hurts. I don't know if you mandate, that's also, mandate that. Or, Chad, I know you're a big proponent of guys just dealing with the shift. And I, I've seen more people do this. Joey Gallo tried to drag bunt against the shift last night. And I was like, hey, he, he got thrown out because he didn't put it in exactly the right spot. But he tried to bunt. Yeah, Matt Olson had one that looked like it was going to be, you know, a double play type ball that was hit against the shift. That was a perfect. But if base in a three-hour game night. you give me more action and fewer walks, fewer strikeouts, it'd be a better product for the, sure. What's what? But and I don't disagree with what you guys are saying. I just I realize I'm guilty of acknowledging that there's about a 17-minute play window. In an NFL game, yeah, and we of a love three-hour game, and, and that's, we love that. that's complete, total, nonstop action for me. 
17 minutes in an NFL it's game crazy. where they actually have the football in play. But the rhythm of it is what we love. You well, see the, the play. You see the replay. Yes. It's broken down. It's discussed. Then well, you anticipate what's eight. coming next. What are they going to do here? It's, it's yeah. the And there's something about that that the American that. sport and culture were perfectly happy with it. But 17 minutes is ridiculous over three hours if you really think about well, it. Well, I mean, if you really want to boil it down, I mean, at Titans Radio, we had, we had four breaks per quarter. I mean, you're taking two and a half minute commercial breaks minimum per quarter um, in w- within the 17 minutes of action, and somehow that they they keep the viewership on that. It's it is, um, and, and part of it is just you know the the it's more of a national brand than Major League Baseball is from a viewing standpoint. Uh, from a if you're if you're regionalizing everything. My guess is you're probably content the way Paul just described it, where it doesn't feel long if you're invested in the team. And I've the also casual been, viewer, I think, is who we're I've speaking to. I've also been to. trained for it, right? I wrote that in the column. I've been trained over the years as it got three minutes longer yeah. this season and four more minutes longer three seasons later. I've been trained for that extra half. An I hour. don't know if the NFL has a casual viewer, I guess is what I'm saying. I think you know, I would maintain you, you, can talk to, you can talk Arizona Cardinals football and people will listen. I don't know if we could sit here and talk Tampa Bay Rays baseball. No, the same way. Not. There's, and, and, no, there's but, no real passive audience yeah. of, uh, of baseball. You're right. And this is the most intense, intently I've watched a baseball game. Again, I uh, talk about being able to scroll Twitter or read something or flip away. I watched this game. You saw the homework sheet. Yep. I watched it very intently because I was looking for something very specific for all nine innings. I haven't watched a game that intently that was a non-Yankees playoff game. In, in years, nor, nor will I, which is fine. I, I, again, interested in the numbers of the batters and what they do stepping out. The pitchers yeah. are the top culprit for slow play constantly. I'm amazed watching major league games when a guy that I think is pitching at a normal pace and the announcers are saying, man, this guy works fast, doesn't he? Wow, look at this guy just working so fast. He gets the ball and he goes right into pitching. I'm thinking... No, everyone else goes too slow. Yeah, those announcers are accomplices. This is, it's, it's, it's Chip Carey who says that. Like, man, this guy's working fast. They're saying it complimentary. Like, this is great that he's getting the ball and going to work. See, and he's so, been trained, too, But my too, thing by is, the they're not quick. Everyone else is slow. He's but been here, trained by the slow. Here's what I think it comes down to. So, you know, there's some rules that we, uh, we were talking about the coaches, I think. Um, maybe it was in college football. I can't remember, but I said that it just comes down to a sportsmanship angle where you have to, there's a handshake agreement on what you guys have to do because it's very difficult. Oh, it's the faking the injury. Tell it, you know, coaches telling players in college to fake an injury. It's very difficult to treat a fake injury in real time as a fake injury. Um, right, because you have yeah, to it, it, health concerns, right? You see a guy drop to the ground, you're he thinking might have a this guy's hurt in, in this day and age of football. Um, I'll use the PGA Tour, for instance. Kevin Na is among the most disliked players in golf. You just Google's name and read all the stories because the PGA Tour, the the professionals on tour will complain about his slow play. They don't want to be behind. They hate being paired with him because they're waiting on him to hit while they're ready to go. They're waiting on him to putt out, and they're ready to go. And the group behind him is ready to go. Yeah, he bogs everything down, and he has been been criticized and players are critical of his slow play. Maybe it comes down to players calling out other players for their slow play on the mound. Like I, I, I to me, there's a there just needs to be a unspoken player initiative with it because I don't know if a, a pitch clock helps you in any great. Ex- I don't know if it really it takes all that much and gives it back to the viewer. Well, it's working in the minor leagues. But minor but, league games but are work, down twenty minutes. Down 20 minutes, but I, I, I guess the, uh, on average you're saying 20 yeah. minutes, but game to game in the majors. I, I think there's a way to, to really slow play the game if you wanted to, trick you could, the play you could clock, fight right? it if the, you wanted to. You could fight it, but I don't think it'll be fought that often. And, and you could fight it in spots where you want to slow down this inning or this batter or whatever. Yeah. But overall, I yeah. think it would have an effect on the game. I think it would have a 20-minute effect on the game, and I think it'd be good for the game. I think it's a shame that it's gotten there, though, I think. And it's my kicker in the column. Throw the pitch. If it's not hit, get the ball back and throw it again. Yeah. 
I mean, it's, it's sad that we've come to the point where you, where you need that. Guys should just naturally work that fast. And they should want to. Who is the fastest working pitcher in baseball? Do we know? I don't know. That's but that's question. what I, sh- I, I Maybe I'll revisit it next year and I'll do it that way. And I'll, I'll, I'll time well, the Well, Ma- Max Freed, who I love, the Braves ace, is a pretty fast working pitcher for the most part. But I can't really think of guys. I mean, I feel like everyone I watched in the 90s, you would have to really pinpoint the guys who are really slow. Yeah, they're well, on the mound. Here's another yeah. thing I would say. I, and I wrote this column a while ago uh, looking at Pitching Ninja where I talked about like seeing the pitching highlights nightly of the best stuff in the league. I wonder how anybody hits. Well, if the pitching is – and hitting is down, clearly. If the pitching is so good, why are you waiting? I, I mean, if I, my slider's nasty tonight and I'm doing great, what am I waiting for? I could understand it. I, I see guys laboring out there who are struggling, who are clearly afraid to throw strikes. I can understand why that guy's throwing slow. Right. I can't understand why the technician who is carving people up, this guy who threw for the Braves last night, who was terrific. Strider. Uh, look, I don't Strider. know what his pace is, but if you've got stuff like he's got, I don't know why you'd be waiting. I'd be eager to get up there and throw my next unbelievable pitch that, that uh, Pitching Ninja is going to be featuring. Because your stuff is awesome. Get up there and strike people out. Make them look like Chad, fools. Chad, who's, uh, who's the Tennessee pitcher that throws 105? Uh, ben Joyce. Yeah, so Ben Joyce, you can, this is a meme out there where he just stands on the mound in the Staring windup. a guy down. And a, the batter steps out of the box, and he just continues to stay, stay on the mound staring does at the not, catcher. Does not move. Guy gets back in, 104 Pitches. right past him. Like you just, he's going to stare him game down. Within and, the game. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give the Cardinals some credit. I'm watching Braves Cardinals last night. First off, their entire bullpen throws 98 plus, which is ridiculous. And they were talking during the game that when Mark Wollers was the closer for the Braves, people would come to the steps of the dugout to watch him pitch warmups because he threw 94. And that was like an oddity in 1993, deal. you know, when he was the closer for the Braves and he was such a hard throwing guy. He said, now everyone throws 94, yeah. 93, 94. If you don't throw 93, 94, but you're not making everyone it Everyone they the brought up, there was five pitches of 104 from one of their guys. Another guy threw 103. Their entire bullpen is 98-plus. And the good news about those guys is they got two pitches. They're not taking much time. Like, when you get up there, they are, they're coming at you. It's coming 100 miles per hour at you, or there's going to be a slider you know, some breaking ball that though, but they're not taking much time to think about. Yeah, it. well, you don't have to Which if you're throwing great. 100. Yes. You know? Absolutely. You, it, you're throwing one or two uh, versions of the same pitch. Yeah, they're not throwing a circle change. It, mixing the that other in there. thing about this whole issue is it should be a cautionary tale to everybody in every sport. Spot your issue early. Don't wait 20 years <laughs> while the game grows by a half an hour. Recognize it three years in. And, and, you know, then you could just have a conversation. Hey, guys, guys, game's starting to slow down. Let's play. Let's get back to it's playing bogging, fast. Yeah. Instead of 20 years from now, we're going to have to put in a pitch clock. And our fan base is going to have shrunk because of X, Y, I just and Z. don't I, – I think the, the national broadcast contracts are not demanding it like the, NFL. like the CBS and ABC and ESPN and NBC, every – Fox. They're all wanting these games in a certain amount of time for network programming. And I don't know if these regional networks are demanding it in the same way. Well, I'll tell you, it's a huge difference being at Central Time. I can watch a game from 6 to 9. Yeah. I don't know how I'd be doing from 7 to 10. I feel like the national games, when you get in the playoffs, you know, NLCS, ALCS, World Series, those games are so long. Yes. I almost think they're telling them to make it longer. Like, they have so much inventory they have to roll through for people that have add-ons from the NFL package that they have to throw into the World Series. We know the breaks are longer, but it's almost like they're trying to get more delays in action well, to get more spots in. You know, and to that point, I mean, Fox wanted the USFL games to be two hours and 45 minutes, not because they wanted to get to other programming. They wanted get to get to, to the, the other game, game or six on a double minutes. header. So they wanted to get the game that was coming up on the field and ready to go and keep that going as much as it was about keeping things below three hours for a concise football game. So if you're – Chad uh, – that's a great point because you, if you don't have a double header for a playoff game and you're trying to milk the series that you have, if it's the NLCS or the ALCS, which are on different networks, it's one game per night and you're trying to keep the audience if it's a close game. I don't care about the length of a playoff game presuming it's, it's tight 
And yeah. most of the time, it's going to be tight, right? But here's bad news, and I'm going to write about this at some point too. Game one of the World Series is not flexible this year. The playoff schedule is set because of the lockout. Game one of the World Series is Sunday, October 30th, that night, against Green Bay at Buffalo. Good luck. Well, and that's exactly why the NFL chose that game for that night. Good luck. Good luck. Better get Yankees Dodgers. Even, that, even so, no, no it's, matter it's what, still get why not, why not Yankees Braves, Chad? Well, he's not expecting Braves that. are America's team. <laughs> they become America's team. Uh, Nashville's team for hockey are the Preds, and they are a team to watch in free agency because of a player that has been here for a decade and a negotiation that is playing out in the public audience now five days before unrestricted free agency begins. Details on that and what we're waiting for as the 13th rolls around for unrestricted free agency in hockey. That's next on Outkick 360.
Friday edition, Outkick 360 across the Outkick network. Big thanks to all of our stations for carrying us live and uh, local throughout your afternoon. And you can find us beyond the show, YouTube, Twitter, and on podcasts, wherever you download your audio. Just search out Outkick 360. We hope you'll like, subscribe, rate, review, the whole gambit with us Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern, 2 to 5 Central. So uh, NHL free agency officially gets going next Wednesday. Wednesday at like noon Eastern, I believe, is when the doors will open for unrestricted free agency. And while it's nowhere close to that of the NFL and how we would cover it, for instance, on this show in particular, there is a public negotiation going on that is rare, not just for the NHL, but this market in particular where we sit in Nashville with the Predators, General Manager David Poyle, and their star, Philip Forsberg, who's been with the team for a decade, 10 seasons. He's coming off a career year, and he's the all-time leading scorer in Predators history. And he's an unrestricted free agent, or will be on Wednesday. The, the negotiations have become so public that you can go to NHL.com and see where David Poyle is quoted as saying what the offer is. It's in the eights. The Preds can offer eight years while other teams can only offer seven. They're going to include in this offer and have included a no movement clause and a no trade clause. That's the general manager publicly admitting what the offer is. But no offer has been signed. And here they sit trying not to look foolish like the organization did and, and Poyle did whenever Ryan Suter did in many ways the same thing, in some ways not the same thing. But the eighth year is what the Preds are hinging on. They're saying, hey, we're going to give you eight and we're going to pay you a little over eight million a year. We can do the math. Even I can do eight times eight is 64. And other teams can offer you seven. And if they're going to give you nine, well, that's going to be 63. So you can come here, make less per year, but make more of the duration of the contract. Very difficult negotiation, though, because you look at the money, and it seems as though he's going, he's, at least his agent, is betting that he can get more than eight, maybe nine. And if that's the case, and they get nothing in return for Philip Forsberg, and look, they'll go out and sign another free agent on the market. Uh, Marchment from the Panthers, uh, Nachuskin from the Avs is available, Niederreiter, uh, Trocek, and others. But they get nothing in return for the guy who would have been traded at the deadline, if not last offseason, knowing that he wasn't going to come back. Because you can get picks and players in return, and you don't get anything for the guy. Locally, the media feels as though he's going to stay. But I say, if this is such an easy layup negotiation that's now public and we know what the Preds are offering, and we know what Forsberg hasn't accepted, what's the holdup here yeah, if it's such an easy done. negotiation? They, they both, too. I haven't heard the comments. I've just read the comments from David Poyle, the GM, and, and from him. They both sound so milk toast. Yeah, you know, we're working on it. We want it to get done. And it just well, sounds so, yeah, but it just it sounds. That's the, that's the sport, my friend. There's no and, and, and let me, the, punch or pizzazz. Well, I'll say, like, so people, we don't know what it is, somewhere between 8 and 9. It's in the 8s. Well, if it's 8.3 and 8.6 gets the deal done, Go. why do you wait this well, long to get it done? That's why I think it's going to get done. And Elliot Friedman's been one reporting, and clearly he is getting reports and info from Forsberg's agent. Mm-hmm. Because he framed one thing he said in saying, if they come up, then they'll get this, talking about e either side of it. And he was saying where he was hearing that. So I, if it's 8.2, that's the offer from the Preds, and they want 8.8, .8, both sides could go up $300,000. Me, yeah. At 8.5. And I think this would be done. But, but this I is... just don't see this deal not getting done over both sides going up well, and down $300,000 to meet in the well, middle of that, I, and especially considering the Preds have the eighth year they can offer. Deadlines I make deals, so maybe well, it's as simple as that. Deadlines make deals, but, but this is also uh, peculiar because 
in, in the NHL specifically, you trade guys at the deadline who you feel you're not going to be able to resign. They, they yeah. took a big chance. Yeah, they definitely they thought they were getting him back. And, and no assurances that that was going to be the case. He wants the no-trade clause. He wants the no-movement clause. He's, he's getting it, according to David Poyle. And from, from the team objective and perspective, I'm not squabbling over $300,000 per season if that means I don't have to now publicly negotiate this with five days to go. It's a very odd yeah, way that this has turned over the last two weeks when they've had over a year to figure this out. And if they come up empty-handed, they're, they're going to get crucified, and I think deservingly so. I mean, I, I just feel like if, if you end up go raising the bar and giving them more, Forsberg and his agent have out-negotiated and outplayed everything because they leaked this, and now Poyle is commenting on it, and the offer is either going to rise or he's going to go to unrestricted free agency and you're likely losing him because there will be another team that throws in more money over seven years, not eight. But again, it, maybe not in total contract value, does he make the same amount of money? But per year, he can make more How on the open market. Uh, what, in his 30s? Is Early 30s? Old? I mean, he's, he's been with the team really for, uh, he's been with the team for uh, 10 years. Yeah, then probably 32, I'd guess. 31, 32. 27. Oh, he's only 27? Yeah. That, that, um, that makes a difference well, but, to me. But teams, but teams right now are signing guys who are 35 to big money contracts in the league. So um, here's Forsberg. And again, I don't, I don't think he's worth $9 million a year. I said this last summer. I would give him, he was making six. I would give him a considerable bump and say, here's our offer. Are you in or are you out? You'd like a, a nice year. contract year performance. And I would say, um, here's our offer. If not, we're going to trade you. And we're going to deal you to a team and get something for you in return. You would have done it during the season. Right. Or, yeah, or, at the deadline. Yeah, at the trade deadline. Because they weren't going anywhere. That. They a big deal. They made the playoffs and they got whipped by Colorado. Yeah, but it is something to watch because it's we've seen this play out with a different storyline a little over a decade ago. And that the good. storm that that caused versus what this will be will be fascinating to watch. Enjoy the weekend. Join us Monday for Outkick 360 right here across the Outkick Network. Don't block the box. Do lock your locks. Remember Brittany Griner.